All right, that's enough of that. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the BDRP Late Show. I'm your host, DDoS, and tonight is a very special and monumental moment for me. You've all heard of, of a man I consider to be a mentor to me in this Bigfoot game, uh, Mr. Tim Kumbo Baker. He's going to be our guest tonight, and we're going to He's going to do what Kumbo does. He's going to tell you all about these things um, and regale you with stories. And uh, we're going to take it back to class 101, Bigfoot basic knowledge, and have us a time and a half doing it. So just get it off the rip. We uh, have Annie's Vincent, Jimmy Osmer. What's up, Jimmy? Michael C., M Mrs. Autumn, uh, Greg House. Greg House is a great dude. Uh, I mean, we have a, a B2B. I'm sorry, Big Dog. T to be, and I have a funny uh, story about how they come in with that name. I was consulted about that name, and I voted against it. <laughs> but and my uh, G Reapers with us. So, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, of course, my co-host, the great Merlin One Eight Seven, Mr. Tim Kumbo Baker. Howdy, folks. Kumbo, yeah. glad to be here. Yes, sir. Glad to have you here. Yeah, I appreciate so, the invitation. Absolutely. And uh, I was bragging on you. There's old Troy. And uh, I brag on you all the time because you'd hey, always Troy. be so appreciative with your time. Um, yeah. There's a couple of field investigations I went on where I'd run into something that, you know, I, I couldn't figure out. First, the uh, number I'd call is Mr. Kumbo Baker. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it just, it, it's it's phenomenal having you on. Like I said, uh, what, so what's new? I know that you're, Semi-retired, right? I am retired, yes. Mm -hmm. Retired. So they, yeah. they, they've raised your jersey up to the rafters, and um, now you're <laughs> coaching. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, after, after I retired from, uh, uh, from Truman State University, and I moved back down here to Alabama in uh, November of 20, and I worked for about a year and a half uh, at – uh, rural King, which is a lot of folks don't know what a rural King is, but it's sort of like a souped up, uh, sort of like a souped up, um, uh, tractor supply, but better. And, uh, <clears throat> they sell, except they sell guns and camping and fishing gear. And, and, uh, they sell all kinds of seeds and feed and they sell, you can, you can buy chickens there, you know, ducks, rabbits, pigs uh wow it's all kind of stuff like that you know? i've never heard of it it's actually a pretty cool place uh i can uh recommend you first time you go in there leave your wallet and your checkbook yeah. and all your credit cards locked in your vehicle and <laughs> otherwise, <laughs> that, otherwise that good. You'll come, yeah you'll come out broke <laughs> that sounds about right from just everything you name we have something yeah. like that down here you've probably been to it. it's called orshland Oh yeah, it's it's very similar to Orsland's, but it's actually a little bit better than Orsland's. Yeah, yeah, Orsland's wow, was one of my favorite places when I lived in Missouri. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, it's not as expensive as Orsland. It's a good thing. Yeah, that's that's what I was about to say. The only thing about Orsland is a little bit pricey, but you're gonna find stuff there you won't find anywhere else. True. Yeah. So uh, I, I, this is what I'm, I, and I'm sure like a lot of my audience wants to hear about this because I have mm -hmm. I've really talked about it. The time mm -hmm. you came down to Brown Springs and uh, we got together and you blew the shofar. Uh-huh. The, the shofar, a lot of people have uh, talk about it and say that, uh, you know, well, it's great. But they really don't know much about it at all. And we, we, we've been uh, talking quite a bit here lately, and I'm glad of it. And I didn't know right. this about you, that you're very well versed in the, you know, ancient writings and, and, and languages and stuff. Right. I started, uh, I got interested in that back when I was just a kid in elementary school. And, uh, I, you know, we've got a place back here on the farm that, you know, my parents have always referred to it. And even my grandparents as Indian territory, because every time we'd, we'd plow this part of the field back there, we would find pieces of pottery and, Oh, you wow. can walk around back there and just pick up lots and lots of uh, arrowheads and stuff. And there's a there's a, a big flint deposit back there. And so there were a lot of arrows 
made there. And we found everything from little bird points up to big, uh, like eight, nine inch long spear points. Back wow. There. And eight or nine inches. Yeah. Very large. In yeah. fact, I, I wonder if they weren't ceremonial because they were so big. They were, right. I've, I, I don't know if they would actually use one that big in, you know, in actual warfare, but we found, you know, grinding stones and paint pots and just all kind of things back there. And I got really interested in archaeology and in we would find uh, fossils and stuff. And um, wow, uh, not right there, but on a, another piece of property that that uh, that my grandmother was half owner of and uh, had a 50 percent interest in. And we would find we found some fossilized dinosaur skin there one time and we would find wow. big big uh, fern stems and stuff that were like six inches in diameter yeah. and uh, in the rocks That's there and, and all kind of, uh, you know, fossilized shells and just different things. And I got real interested in that, but I got, was more interested in the, uh, the, the native culture and such. And, and I got to, uh, you know, want to go digging around places and stuff. And my parents, I don't know where they got this thing, but they gave me a like a little archae junior archaeologist kit or something one year for my for Christmas. That's awesome. And I love that thing. And it and it, part of it, it was teaching you how to do plaster casts of things. And they had a replica of the Rosetta Stone in there, uh, which is that's a wow. The Rosetta Stone was one of the oldest is one of the oldest examples of of writing uh, of a of a printed. Or, or not really printed, but of a uh, of writing that's been found, and it was uh, yeah. from the old Sumerian Empire, and and it was written in in cuneiform Three different languages. Yes, yeah, yes. and uh, and anyway, they uh, there was a there was a deal in there, and you and you could you could make a plaster cast of the uh, of the uh, this replica rosetta stone and i did it and and then wow you know then they i got interested in trying to learn to read you know read some of the cuneiform stuff and and what was funny was some of the you know uh, i looked up stuff i'd go to the library and look up uh, look up things in you know encyclopedia britannica and stuff and we'd go to museums whenever we were traveling around and and uh but i i started learning a little bit about how to read cuneiform and uh and then i got interested in the old hieroglyphics and stuff and then started trying to learn how to you know learn more about ancient greek and some of the other uh, old languages and stuff and and so i never yeah, dreamed that, yeah and i never dreamed that any of that would have anything to do even in the slightest way when i got got serious about researching Bigfoot back in the mid seventies. And, uh, but I'd been interested in Bigfoot since I was a, just a kid because, you know, we had them out, you know, we, we've got them here on the farm and, uh, you know, they're around, there's a, there's a, there's a, uh, a troop that lives here on the farm year round. And then there's another one or two that moves in and out of here seasonally. They'll show up in October and they leave in April. And, uh, but, uh, they they really are there because uh, oh yeah I mean they inundate the place because around the phone you have to deal with them. Uh, right exactly which, which is and, a, a wild thing to, even here right I I had to uh, I had to uh, rebuke one of them here a couple of weeks ago my my younger male German Shepherd had gotten sprayed by a skunk for the third time in a month. <laughs> And, uh, and, uh, and it happened the last time I, I took them out, took them out for their, uh, take care of their business right before we went to bed. And so it was around midnight or so he comes back, you know, reeking and stinking, uh, you know, been sprayed <laughs> by a skunk. Of course he wanted to run right in the house, you know, and, you know, to him, he was all perfumed up and, you know, ready to go out on town or something. So yeah, I made, I made him stay on the porch. And he usually sleeps in the house at night. At about 
two in the morning, I was uh, I was woke up by him just doing some absolutely furious barking, and uh, and it's not like him to bark like that at all. And right, I got up and I looked out the kitchen window, and he was he usually sleeps down on the east end of the porch. Now this is a screened porch. He usually stays, hangs out down there when we're out, out on the porch. And that's where he was when we went to bed. And, uh, he was backed up and was right out in front of the, the porch swings, which are close to the, you know, to the front door. And he was backed up and he had, he was standing his ground, but every hair on his body was standing straight up. He was barking like crazy. And he had his head down and his front legs were stiff, but his tail was tucked between his legs and he was barking a very frantic bark and, and looking down towards the east end of the porch. Right. And there's a hedgerow that comes up next to the house down there on the east end. And, um, I mean, I'm talking about is there's just enough room between the, between the edge of the hedgerow and, and the house to, to make a couple of passes through there on the riding mower. So it's, we're talking about less than 10 feet. And I grabbed, I keep a spotlight right there just inside the door. I grabbed the spotlight and I stepped down on the porch and clicked that spotlight on. And there was one standing there, uh, right there in the hedgerow, not, not a less than 20 feet from the end of the porch. And, uh, I put the light right in his face and it, it, uh, it was looking down at Joe. It really didn't even pay attention to me. It was focused on Joe. When I put the light in its face, it looked real quickly. It looked down into its right to, to, you know, hide its eyes. And then it sort of turned, it turned, but it turned to its left and walked uh, walked south a little bit so that I couldn't see see him around the corner of the house. But it was a big one. I went back there later. I marked really good. I could see a couple of limbs there in the hedgerow, and I marked really good where his where its head was in relationship to that limb. And I went and found it the next day and determined that the dude was he was at least nine and a half feet tall. Wow. And, yeah. And because it was looking down at Joe rather than looking straight at me and into the light, its eyes glowed more yellowish. But we're talking about big old eyeballs that were about, you know, about probably seven inches apart, plus or minus a little bit. And uh, definitely Damn. not, yeah, definitely not a deer or anything else. You know, there's nothing else out here that's, that's got mm -hmm. eyes that far apart. And we don't have cattle on the farm anymore. And even if we did, cattle aren't nine feet tall. I, no, I not at all. Back when we yeah, used to show, yeah. when we used to show cattle, we, uh, we had them do a lot of different things, but we never taught them to walk on their back legs. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I could I could attest this, folks, because uh, we were talking on the phone, and just as casually as he told it to y'all, yeah, is, is how he described it to me, like uh, it. And I was like, what? You know, I didn't grow up with these yeah. things on my property. I yeah. grew up around them. So it's just kind of kind of ooky spooky yeah. to hear even. Yeah, he was yeah. letting his dog go to the bathroom the other night and we got to hear all about it. Yep. Yeah, they uh, they come around. Uh, you know, I see them out. I see them fairly often. You know, now very, very rare do I see a, you know, full body. But yeah. I'll see them through, through the brush or I'll see the eye shine and, you know, see them out there looking at us and I know when they're there because of the way the dogs act. And yeah. plus I get the feeling, you know, I, my spidey senses right. go off. And, uh, definitely feel it. Oh yeah. And, uh, and let, let, let me ask you this, Tim. I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, what I was going to say was, uh, uh, I ended up for the, I've only done this a couple of times ever, but first time I've ever had done this on the farm, but I was worried that that dude would, since I wasn't going to let Joe in the house, I was worried that it would be back trying to catch him. And there was a big hole in the screen down on that end of the porch. And I was afraid it might see that as an invitation to 
you know, maybe crawl on up on the porch. But I, yeah. so I went ahead and, and I, I rebuked it. I rebuked it in the name of Christ, Jesus Christ. And Amen. Told it to leave us, you know, leave us alone, leave my dog alone. And then I, then I specifically told it, you know, don't hurt my dog and, and, you know, get out of here. And I told him, you know, I commanded him with a, in the name of, of Jesus to, to leave us, to leave us, to leave the, uh, leave the area there around my house. And it did, Amen. but, uh, Amen. Wow. you know, you can, you can sit out there most any evening that, it, that the weather's halfway decent. And, and generally after you've been out there a little while, rocks will start landing out in the yard in front of the porch and they'll come from behind that hedgerow and they'll, all, I've got a cedar windbreak along the West side of the, the property and, uh, uh the, the West side of the yard and the rocks will come sailing out of that and uh, out from behind there and land out in the yard. And I pick them up because I you know, don't want to run over them with a lawnmower. And, and uh, That's what I was just thinking. Are they being ornery? Yeah. Like they're trying to, you know, just no, inconvenience just, you? No, that's, it's, just, it's just juvies. It's just juvies oh, okay. messing with us and letting us know that they're there. And I'll, I'll clap sometimes for them and say, that's a good one, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah. you know, I don't they mind those, but... I, I don't yeah, mind that at all. The guitar for them. Oh, they love music. Absolutely love. Yep. Well, they're they're not. They don't like. They don't care for Led Zeppelin. They don't like Led Zeppelin. They, yes, you know, not or, at all. Or or Van Halen, and uh, <laughs> and and now I'm really wondering about them because I got them to cut up one time playing a George Jones song, and uh, that just ain't right that they shouldn't like George Jones. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Everybody's like. I'll tell you what, they don't like Pink Floyd either. We played the great gig in the sky um, when what, Chuck said What, and, what and was our, that? It's a Pink Floyd song called The Great Gig oh, in the Pink, Sky. Yeah, Pink Floyd. Yeah, they don't like a lot of Pink Floyd. And, At uh, all. That's when we heard the big banshee scream down there in the Springs. Yeah. But they, uh, yeah, there's there's a number of different artists that they don't like. But uh, I'll tell you what, if they ever cut up and carry on with Hank Williams' is on, I'll have to run them out of here now. <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> I, 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 ain't, be, I ain't gonna put up with that. You know, I'm not. That'll be a little bit too much. Anybody heckling Hank Williams, you know. I don't blame you. It's, it's American treasure. Or Johnny Cash, you know. <laughs> Johnny Cash, my personal hero. They better, they better don't. They better leave John alone. Yeah. Yeah. Old John Cash. I was gonna ask you about the electromagnetic field. I had a theory. That, that okay. feeling you said when your spider sense goes off. Yeah. It, th that's tangible. That's something tangible in the air. It feels like. Uh, yeah. Is it the? Is do you think it has something to do with electromagnetic magnetic field or? Because that's just what I, I comes think. To I think it's. I don't know. It's uh, you know, it's a. That it, that that sixth sense is something that has been tested, and they have the military has done a lot of a lot of of uh, testing on it, and they found out it's it's a, that it is a real thing. Um, right. Uh, yeah. That, in a matter of fact, they found out that. Uh, the people who have longer hair are better at it than people that have shorter hair. It's one of the things the military mm -hmm. uh, found out. That's interesting. Uh, so that's been yeah. scientifically proven. Yep. Huh. Yep. And, uh, and I think, you know, I don't, my hair is not very long, but, uh, but I do have a pretty good, I keep my beard grown out a fair amount, not, not very far, but, but I think that helps, uh, yeah, well, mine should be doing you real know, good since it's migrating from the top of my head down to my back. Oh, uh, yours too. My, yeah, mine too. Yeah. It comes, it's growing out of my ears and everywhere, <laughs> everywhere else. But, uh, my, mine's uh, making a stop at my nose. So uh, yeah. I'll tell you what, I, I've yeah. always thought that too. The beard, like, cause a lot of native tribes say that they, the hair's nerve endings as well. So, right, exactly. So I don't know if it's if it's picking up some kind of electromagnetic field, uh, electro electromagnetic field, or if, if it's picking up their aura, because uh, you know we th we have an aura and we can absolutely and and we can project that whether we want to or not. I know uh, kids that I teach about hunting and stuff. Uh, I talk I talk to them about the Zen of hunting. Now people think, oh, he's talking about Zen. That's the Eastern religion. That's counter to. God, no, I'm not talking about that. And we're not talking about anything that has to do with your salvation, your soul. I'm talking about that. Uh, <laughs> when, 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 you're out there, when you're out there hunting, if you have a, 
predator attitude. If all you're thinking about is, is killing something and looking for something to kill, you're going to have a lot less luck. And if you do see something and you're sitting there staring at it, thinking about killing it, then I've seen, I've seen deer two or 300 yards away, stop and look in my direction before Absolutely. back, back before I, I learned better. And, uh, you have to, uh, you have to learn to pull in that, that energy. And uh, it's, I know this sounds stupid and it, it sounds not like all. some kind of a no, not, yeah, you know, not at all. N- new age, uh, kind of BS, but it's true. You, you've got to learn to pull in that, that, uh, that, that, that killer instinct, that killer attitude, that killer aura. And you've got to sort of go neutral, you know, or just sort of. Yeah. You know, in the special everything in. they teach people when they're uh, trying to teach them how to take out a century or anything like that, or when right. they're doing the belly crawl that they not to make any eye contact with them. You can't look Absolutely. at the, especially the back of their head and you have to right. think happy thoughts. Or they will right. sense you and turn around. Yeah, and I, I, I'll tell you what, Tim. I'd like to, uh, we we got a good uh, crowd here. They've been primed up for these type of conversations because that's exactly right. what I say when I when I go out uh, down there in Brown Springs. I'd go without a weapon, as you know, and yep. I would just yep. inundate myself in the area. I would just kind of meander through as if yep. I belong there. You know, I, yep. I wouldn't if I saw one. I wouldn't stare at it like you said. And uh, right, you don't want you know you know actually don't look right at them. Don't make eye contact. And that's what I do when I'm deer hunting. I mean, I've had, I've had deer right on top of me. I mean, just, you know, within feet of me. I've, in fact, I've touched deer before and, uh, God, I used to do that. I used to get a thrill out of doing that. And, uh, back when I was a teenager till one kicked the crap out of me and, and, uh, put a huge bruise on my leg on the calf of my, not the calf, but one of my, one of my thighs where it kicked me. And, uh, so I you got that lucky. stuff. Yeah. I got real lucky, but I uh, used to stalk hunt when I, when I actually did hunt, um, cause I didn't think anything else. I don't know. Stock hunting seems fair to me. You know what I mean? It's right. even the playing field a little bit, but, uh, yep. I was in one of those situations where one came uncomfortably mm-hmm. close. It was a 12 point. Mm-hmm. So, uh, oh, wow. yeah, that was one of the few times I, uh, cause I just knew if I looked up at that thing, I could feel it. I felt that great disturbance in the forest. Like mm-hmm. if, I, if I want to continue to be pretty, I better not look up at look up at it. I just I felt it, and it walked by me, and it looked past me, and just kind yeah. of trotted it on. Me and I got my cousin when we were young with uh, went hunting one time, stalk hunting, and it was the first time we'd ever come across any of that doe pee, right? Uh huh. And uh, he got a little too slap peppy with it, <laughs> and yeah. the buck came after him on the rut, and that that buck almost rendered him. He had to shoot it, and it slid right up to his foot. Well, uh, I was uh, des- desecrating, uh, walking to my stand one morning early, and I was uh, desecrating uh, some scrapes that I was coming along, coming across along a, a scrape line. Uh-oh. And uh, all of a sudden, I, I heard one grunting and looked up. Here came a 10 point down the hill after me. Ooh. And I whirled around and, uh, it was coming after me and I literally shot him right off the end of my rifle barrel. I mean, I, I, when I pulled the trigger, I blew a, I mean, I powder burned his skin and blew a, blew about a four inch diameter hole through his through his fur. And of course, right in the middle of that was the bullet hole. But, uh, wow. Uh, but yeah, that thing just about got me. Yeah, I was and, scared. Uh, I was too scared to move. Bro. I'm not, I'm not going to lie to you, Tim. I was too scared to move. And, uh, I just watched it. And hope well, it didn't, didn't uh, you know, sense me there. Well, this thing, it, I, I didn't even have, I didn't even have time to get scared. Yeah. This happened, but after it was all over with, I was shaking like a dog pooping peach pits, you know. And, uh, <laughs> no doubt. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it scared me pretty. It it scared me pretty bad. That's when I, bad. I. That's when I wanted to become a fisherman. After I think that was my last time. I yeah. Was, as a matter of fact. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's let's go back to the shofar. Um, yes. Uh. Uh-uh. Let me uh, let me see. Somebody asked a pretty good question up here. Uh, Cajun jewels. Uh, what's your theory as to why these things show themselves to some and not to others? And I think it's 
it can be familiarity that they've gotten to know the person over a period of time of seeing them, seeing them over and over again, and that they have figured out that that person's not a danger to them or to the other members of their troop or their family unit. And, and they'll reveal themselves. And I think sometimes it's just the fact that they, uh, that they can sense our intent. Yes. And our, uh, I wouldn't say necessarily our personality, but the nature of our soul or, or whatever from a distance. Uh, I, I truly believe that's it. Now, that doesn't mean that just because you haven't seen a Bigfoot means that you got a bad soul. Not, not at all. It's just that you haven't been in a situation yet where where they can figure you out, you know, where you've been around them enough that that uh, that that they can sort of get to know you and or and 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 figure you out. Now, you know, a lot of people don't realize it, but uh, you know, a lot of times you you think they're not there at all. You think you're not even in booger territory, and you never know they're there. They they'll they'll pace you for. If miles. you're out on a hike, they'll t- pace you for miles and miles. Yeah, and uh, they'll and they'll choose a time to to you know do some little thing to let you know that they're there. I, uh, back in 2016, I was elk hunting in uh in Wyoming. We'd been out there four or five days, and uh, uh, we went up on up this one trail for about the third time. And we went up there, and we uh, uh, we had hunted we had hunted somewhere else that morning, and we went up there after lunch, and we were going up the side of this mountain, and it got to a point it was so steep that we the horses couldn't go anymore. It was rocky, and they were sliding around, so we hobbled the horses down in a in a, one of the last uh, groves of ponderosa pines before we reached the the timber line. And we started up from there and we hadn't gone very far in right in the middle of this trail that we were, that we were walking. And we'd been there that after the, the evening before and it wasn't there then, but right in the middle of that trail was a big old, about a 17, 18 inch track. <laughs> and it was just bites. It was one of these ones where, you know, Scotty beamed it down, standing on one foot, and it mm-hmm. and, and it and it materialized long enough yeah. to mash that one footprint down in the into the dirt, and then then he beamed him right back up because there was nothing around. We looked around to see if we could find any more tracks, and and there were none. No, and sir, I think, yeah. and I think that was just, I think that was just their way of say, hey, we know you're up here, uh, you know. We're here too. <laughs> right. But but uh, how are they doing that? Like I used, I, I had the theory that they were jumping because they can jump for a phenomenal uh, amount of space, but I, I've yeah. seen them where they, where, I mean, they'd have to be, uh, uh, yeah. Have springs for legs or something. Not well, that, if they did that footprint would be five foot deep. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. That's, that's one of these things. <laughs> <laughs> it, it makes me nervous, out. Tim. Yeah, it, that, that, yeah. When I, I've only seen it once. Um, and it made me nervous. <laughs> you know, well, I, know <laughs> I know one time I saw one start from from a standing start, and by the time it's it's a uh, foot hit hit the ground the third time, it had covered almost seventy feet. Dad, gum. Yeah, that's, that's madness. And that's starting from from a standing start, and. Uh, yeah, and and I know, you know, I've had uh, seventy I've, feet. I've, I've took an extremely reliable report from a uh, from a family member that uh, saw a well, he he saw a dog man cross a four lane highway, and it touched the ground once right out of the trees on the uh, on the uh, south side of the highway, touched the ground once in the median and once just as it was going into the trees on the north side of the highway. And that's a hundred and something foot wide right away, you know, cleared through there. Lord of mercy. And, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, they can clear a good 35 yards with one bound. Easy. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and yes, we do and have see, dog. Tim, you're one of the few people that agree with me. Uh, I'm, 
Absolutely. Uh, uh, you want to people that somebody, agree with me on on. Uh oh. On on what? Go ahead. Can you hear me? Can, yeah, I can. Hello? You can hear me, okay? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know what that was, but uh, you're one of the few people that agree with me on the fact that Bigfoot is ph phenomenally, uh, phenomenally greater threat than Dogman. Dogman may look scary, right. but um, I, I mean, there's more. There's more of these Sasquatch creatures, and there's a whole plenty of reasons well, why they're more dangerous. Well, I did. A, I spent. I spent about thirty years, believe it or not studying a 300 square mile area that was that I consider prime Bigfoot habitat. And it's my standard that I judge habitat all over the rest of the world by. And, um, and I studied the, the different troops and did my best estimate of the population of Bigfoot within that 300 square mile area for years. And I used the same techniques that, that the department of the interior and the Audubon society and other groups and, uh, and the forestry U S forestry service and stuff uses to study, to estimate the populations of rare animals in an area. And I even used, I even used some of the same software. I bought a software package called presence, P R E S E N C E that I used to, uh, it's sort of a database kind of a thing, uh, that you fill in a lot of stuff. And I kept track of the, of the different troops that lived in this area and, and the population of them. And I did a, I've actually been feet on the ground in uh, researching in 43 out of 50 States. Wow. And, uh, the States I have not researched in are, Alaska, Hawaii, Oregon, uh, Montana, uh, Michigan. Let's see, me watch it. Uh, Alaska, Hawaii, uh, Oregon, Montana, uh, Michigan, Connecticut, and believe it or not, South Carolina. Those are the seven states I haven't researched in. And, uh, but I have done a lot of study of the, that doesn't mean that I haven't been in the area or been in those states. I'm just saying that I haven't researched, yeah. specifically researched Bigfoot. Yeah. But I've done a lot of, I've noted the habitat and such throughout the states. And I've done a, <laughs> I came up with a, with a, factor <laughs> I, I, I joke when i wrote up my report i jokingly call, called it my the the uh bigfoot per square inch <laughs> factor <laughs> but uh but Most i figured up i figured up the average the average amount of bigfoots per square inch and in, in all 50s of the states and, uh, <laughs> per square inch <laughs> and uh, uh but it's a book of Enoch uh, stuff and, and but I spent a lot of time studying the habitat in 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 all the states, and uh, and sighting reports and such. And I don't put a whole lot of stock in sighting reports because a lot of people, like for instance, Rhode Island, you know, probably per capita the richest state in the in the United States and in the smallest one. Definitely. That's not, and that's not a place that you think that you would come across Bigfoot. But there are a few legit Bigfoot reports out of Rhode Island. No kidding. Uh, yeah, believe it or not, and there are some legit reports out of Connecticut. But I never got to go do any investigate investigating in Connecticut. Uh, huh. But I, I mean, I've been weird places chasing Bigfoot. I mean, Staten Island, New York, uh, uh, Long Island. Uh, uh, the Long Forest Island. Preserve, Long Island, New York, forest preserves in um in Chicago in the Chicago area, and a lot of the big uh they call them they call them forest preserves, and 
I mean, but they're all over Chicago, and and you'd be surprised at a number of Bigfoot that are within the city limits of Chicago and and its suburbs. I believe it. I, I actually yeah. moved my niece, whose husband's in the military, from yeah. Chicago down to New Orleans, and there was whole mm -hmm. uh, herds of, of coyote running around in these suburbs and stuff. Yes, sir. Real you thick. are correct. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, me. Based, based on all that, uh, back about uh, oh, I don't know. It's been it's been probably six, seven, eight years ago now since I last updated it, but. My conservative, my conservative estimate of the number of Bigfoot in the U.S. is around sixty-four thousand. However, that population is growing, and my gut instinct tells me that there's enough unknown in there and habitat that I had misjudged that uh, that I think it's closer to a hundred thousand because I just thought that I had been around over, over a lot of Nebraska, for instance, right. and had accurately judged the habitat in, in Nebraska. However, I rode my motorcycle out there two years ago and found that it has way more. It has orders of magnitude more good Bigfoot habitat in, in Nebraska than I than I ever dreamed that, it had, that I knew it had. Really? Because I just hadn't been in the right parts of the state. Uh, I had been mostly along the... Uh, Around the Missouri River and way out in in uh, in northwestern Nebraska, you know, out from Scotts Bluff and uh, out in in that area. And I'd been out in there multiple times, but I had not been in the northern tier counties that border South Dakota. And hmm. I was way off, and I was way off on the amount of good habitat in in uh, in South Dakota as as well, but. Uh, I wouldn't think South Dakota would be, you know. I would tell people they were wasting their time. No, nah, there are there are areas of South Dakota that are that are that are pretty good. That now I've never found any. I've never found any sign out there, but there are reports. Uh, there are a few reliable reports from South Dakota, huh. and uh, I never found any sign. But uh, but I've actually uh, I've found, uh, you know, the surprising amount of sign in in part different parts of Nebraska. But uh that's extremely surprising. What what blew my mind is back in the in the eighties, the first time I went out to Edwards Air Force Base in California, uh I was utterly astounded that there were a, believe it or not, a few Bigfoot out in that totally that desolate moonscape desert out there. I mean, yeah. Not many, but there's a few. And uh, what do they do? I, mean, I guess they can move across vast spaces, you know, a whole lot quicker than right. I imagine. So, well, they were, I believe it or not, that. at the time they were they were coming and going on base, you know, raiding dumpsters in different places. And, and yeah. uh, wow, yeah, yeah, they're uh, things are bold. Yeah, they are. They yeah. out in that area, they are. They uh, they seem to be more bold the further west you go. In a not necessarily yeah. not not any more dangerous or anything, but just I think there's so little good cover out there that that uh, you're uh, left a little choice, maybe. Yeah, yeah. they just they yeah, they're a little less little less uh, uh, secretive. Uh, right. I know. I saw a I saw a, a terrific video that a uh, a lady in a who lives outside of a uh, near Shiprock, New Mexico, uh, has and and it's walking across the side of a hill. One of them walking across the face of a hill in broad daylight. There ain't no doubt what it is. I mean, that's a right. uh, that. I mean, there. That's another thing to people. Hey, how come you ain't got no good pictures <laughs> of them? Hey, hey, why you ain't got any more video? There's tons of uh, fantastic pictures. There's tons of fantastic video, but. Nobody wants to show it, you know, make it public because they don't want to be go through all the ridicule and, and stuff that, 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 yes, that so many people do. I can attest to that. Um, uh, uh, have I been to South Louisiana? I've been south of a little south of Alexandria, I've been in the uh, uh, Kisatchee State Forest, 
uh, and that's about as far south in Louisiana that I've been. I spent a lot of time when I worked for the power company down there fixing uh, fixing some hurricane damage around Lake Pontchartrain, and I heard some stories, but I didn't get to, we were so busy, I didn't get to go out and do any rooting around. I was so tired at night that that uh, all I want to do is, is hit the rack, so I wasn't out going out doing any calling down around Lake Pontchartrain, but, uh, but they're there. there. There was a, there's a city, and I'm I'm not going to say what city, and I'm not going to say uh, how long I was there. But there was a city you told me about that I was just let's say passing through, and uh, uh -huh. spending a little bit of time. You, you remember what you know what I'm talking about? And did I ever tell uh, you I went to that place that you suggested? Uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just say it. it was it was there was an apartment complex in this big city in the south, and I was there for a little uh, bit. And I wanted okay. to go squatching, and you and you were like, and you, you just mapped it out for me, and I was like, okay. eh, I don't know, this is pretty I, I, far. I, I think I know where you're talking about. Yeah. And there's a there's a big river that runs through it. It cuts across, you know, uh, that part of the state. And uh -huh. uh, I didn't know how close this. And there was an uh, it was an apartment complex, and behind it was this old mill or something, or, or it was in a factory. I don't know what it was, but. Uh, coming through there it was like a little tributary or a creek, and sure enough, I saw a sign in there. And this was in the this it wasn't the middle of a city, but it was it was within the city limits. You get to downtown within ten minutes. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it's uh, uh it, it, it's it shocked and surprised me. But the way you told me on the phone, just casually said it. I mean, I could I could have been dropped off there and went to every place that you said because you mapped it out so perfect. <laughs> Huh. And there was sure enough sign within a, a big American city in the south of Sasquatch. Uh -huh. So yeah. I mean, it wouldn't be anything for them to have that, that apartment complex right there. I yeah, mean, well, they could step over the fence. I, I was the first researcher that ever talked about urban Sasquatch, and they just about crucified me when I when I brought it up, and started talking about it, and then, but That's there crazy. were enough people that like, huh, you know. I, that may explain something that you know that's happened here, or that may explain something that's going on. And and there's you know some researchers heard it and they got out, got to digging around and found out. Well, Dad Gum Kumbo knows what he's talking about, you know, <laughs> but, down to the T. And you know, I'll just but, say, I'll just say it. I guess it, it doesn't I, matter now. Dallas, it was it was in Dallas when I was staying there. And yeah, you, you told me about this certain place, and yeah. I was like, I, you know, I believed you. I believed every word of it because you ain't never steered me wrong, but. Sure, yeah. it wasn't that far in either, bro. Down that creek. No, it's no, it's yeah. I know where you're talking about. I know. Yeah, it, I it, it was spooky. <laughs> uh, <the, laughs> yeah, I, I, I went at night too, and I was like, Ooh. <laughs> yeah. And that place, uh, that's one of those places that you, once the sun goes down, it's other yeah. than the glow, the glow from all the city lights in the sky. It's hard. It's hard for you to believe that you're in a. Uh, you can drive. Two blocks and you and you're in pretty much wilderness. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, exactly. You with, with barely it, see a tree. The city limits. You're right. in the city yeah. limits. Barely see a tree two blocks away. You go there, you're in the jungle. Yep. yep. And, and uh, it, it's, it's remarkable how how resourceful these things are and how really mm -hmm. intelligent they are. Because I oh, mean, yeah. they they have to be coming up to these apartment complex dumpsters. Right. Well, let's let's go back to the shofar. Um, yes. So. Uh, all right. Uh, myself and another researcher in Kentucky were the first people that, that figured out about the shofar. Actually, it was mostly the other researcher. He, he found out enough stuff that, that I started going back and studying a bunch of the old scriptures, the ancient scriptures. And he had figured out what he thought the shofar was and well, well, he kept coming across these phrases that the Nephilim and Raphim, I can't remember what the other thing is called that these, these offspring of when the fallen angels came down to earth and laid with the daughters of men and their, their offspring were, uh, there's a lot of negative qualities to them, but they're commonly referred to as Nephilim. And, uh, but that, that the, when the end times come, these, these Nephilim are 
compelled. They, in other words, they have no choice but to respond to the voice of God. Well, if you look at some of that uh, ancient Greek and, uh, and ancient uh, Aramaic, you realize that when they're talking about the voice of God, I mean, it, it translates as the voice of God in our language. But when you go back to the, to the root language of those uh, ancient scriptures, what they're talking about is not, not what comes out of God's mouth, not God's speech, but they're talking about an object. Right. And it took me a lot of digging a lot of digging and my, my buddy had a had an idea what the voice of God was but I had to get confirmation of it and it took a a lot of digging I mean we worked on this for oh, well over 10 years and uh, oh wow yeah and finally I found that the voice of God was a very specific type of shofar and you know there are th there are three main types of shofar that are described in the bible and the voice of god is is one particular type of of those types and it well first i had to f i found out that it was a shofar and then i had to find out well, what kind of shofar and that was just all kind of heartbreaking misery. And I ended up having to <laughs> contact a bunch of ancient language scholars, you know, guys, scholars that were experts in, in ancient Greek and ancient uh, Aramaic and right. some of the, some of the uh, root languages that, that the, that the, a lot of the old Testament was originally written in Hebrew and Assyrian. Oh. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, well, even before Hebrew, uh, the Aramaic was the, predecessor yep. to Hebrew. Right. But it took a, I wasn't enough to scholar, of a scholar to just pick it up and read it. I had, there were, there were words and phrases and symbols and stuff in there that I didn't know. Uh, but I mean, I was picking through this stuff one letter at a time, literally. And it, you know, it took me years to translate some of the, the stuff I came across and, and or to or to get help if I was stumped to find the right person to give me help to figure out what it meant. And uh, anyway, so I figured out that it was a that it was a shofar. Then I started looking for one the, of the correct type that I could afford. And I honestly believe that Heavenly Father led me to it. Amen. Because because. Normally they start at around eight hundred bucks. Dang and actually, gum. Yeah, and the ones that that are actually the exact correct type and length and have all the desirable characteristics, those things typically are any they're uh, you know they're up around twelve hundred to you know twenty five hundred dollars. I stumbled that, into that's... I stumbled into a an antique shop that had been closed for years and years and years. And somebody came in and opened it back up out on the side of highway 63, North of Macon, Missouri. And Macon is a little town of about seven or 8,000 people. And maybe not that much, say 3,500 people out sort of in the middle of nowhere in, in, uh, in, in Northeastern Missouri. And I just, we decided we want to stop there because, you know, I like to go in and look at, look for old cast iron stuff and, and old tools and, and right. junk like that. And, uh, so I'm in there looking at that. The, the wife I had then, she went off rooting around looking for other things and she called me and she said, Hey, I think I might've found, one of these horns that she'd been looking for for so long because she'd heard me, me and this guy talking about them for several years. <laughs> yeah. And I went, so I said, where are you? She told me, and I took off almost at a run back there. 
And there she was standing there holding it. The second I laid eyes on it, I knew that was it. I mean, I mean it took my breath away. And, and I got a hold of it, and there was a price tag hanging on it. Guess what the price tag was? A hundred dollars. Thirty-five dollars. No 30, way. And it it was the voice of God. And it was the voice of God. Wow, bro. Now, yeah, that's it, that's providence. And there were there's a number of little fine details ab about it that for it to be the one that works correctly. Little little sort of hidden details that you gotta know what to look for. And I'd read so much about it and studied so much about it by at that point that that I right then I I looked at it and I'm like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. You know, I kept looking in and every and I kept just checking off all the boxes mentally, you know, because I'd I'd spent so much time about it. And uh I'm like uh hey, wood bugger. Wood bugger farm. farms, yep. Yeah, I see Old you there, slick Rick. Yeah. Yep. And uh but anyway, I uh, I couldn't believe that uh, that, it, that it was it, and so needless to say, I bought it. <laughs> and oh, first thing I did is I I uh, I took a picture of it. <laughs> and I sent it to my research buddy in Kentucky, and he's like, "Oh my god, oh my god, buy it, buy it, buy it!" You know, he's going crazy. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> Tim, so, you're right. What else could that be but God? I mean, something yeah. that's what twenty five hundred dollars. You find it on a whim with all the specific just, characteristics that you would like. Yeah, we yeah. were just going. We were just going down the highway and saw a car sitting out in front of the place, and said, <laughs> "I wonder if anybody's in there." You know, it's wow. I whooped around. I whooped around. Drove, drove right up in the front of it. We were the only people there. There in this one lady, and uh, she said, "Yeah, we're we're trying to get out and back up." I said, "You mind if we just look around?" And she's no, go ahead. So we took off and lo and behold, st stumbled across the shofar. So they weren't <laughs> even officially open yet. That's no. real. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> and uh, and the price the price sticker on it, no telling how old that thing was, because the place had been closed <laughs> for years. But she told me five bucks. It. So she sold it to me for what what was marked on it, and so then. I started trying to blow the thing and all I did was get blood blisters on my lips. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I couldn't make Thank it God work. Good. Oh yeah. Yep. All the time. So there was this Jewish uh, mystic and, and scholar, biblical scholar, uh, old Testament and, uh, and, and ancient, you know, ancient text scholar up in upstate New York that had helped me a bunch. So I called him, sent him a picture of it. And he was uh, he was amazed that you know what I had. He said, "Yeah, that's 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 the right thing. That's it." <laughs> and uh, and I said, "Well, how do you blow it?" Of course, he wouldn't tell me. Uh, he wouldn't tell me. The uh, Kurtz want me to tell about what happened in <laughs> in Oklahoma. Uh, we, uh, we, uh, we'll get to the questions, Kurt. Mister Moser, yeah. Kurt Moser is a great guy, folks. We'll get to yeah. all the questions at the very end, everybody. So if you put them in all caps, um, yeah. we'll, we'll we'll gather them all at the very end and answer them all yeah. together. Yeah. And by the way, hey, Kurt. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, hey, Kurt. So anyway. Greg Graham. So I, uh, I went through all this. The guy wouldn't tell me. He just wouldn't come out and tell me. He made me work for everything, which is a good thing. Yeah, and, I respect uh, that. Yeah. So he gave me some hints. So I'd go off and I'd he'd give me some hints. I'd go out and dig and dig and dig and dig and you know dig through all kind of old old scriptures, old uh, you know the non canonical by, uh, uh, books of the Old Testament, just just all kind of stuff and and old texts and uh, old ancient art, ancient artwork, uh, old uh, what they call it, illuminated. Uh, illustrations or whatever back from yeah the illuminated yeah. bibles those old schools yeah 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 he said basically don't look at anything that was printed after about 1850 you know go back the mm. older the older you can find the better absolutely and, uh, and i first thing i learned when i did that was how to hold it and then then uh 
I finally, finally figured out the notes that I was trying to, to hit. And I, I about ruptured my lungs trying to do it. And I, I don't know how they, I mean, it was uh, exceedingly difficult for me to, uh, to hit the notes. And I even took it to some really good musicians that, that like play the French horn and, and, uh, you know, that, that play the French horn and the trumpet and the cornet and stuff right. like that and trombone. And I got them to try it out and, you know, told them what I was looking for. And, you know, they're, they're blowing their guts out, you know, and, and giving, huh. you know, rupturing their lungs and all trying to do it. So and, even these brass players, these, these, these people who play trumpet yeah. and French. Wow. Yeah. That's interesting. They, they couldn't hit the right notes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I told them what we were looking for, and uh, they. Uh, but you know what was crazy was I was doing all this straining to hit those notes, and one day I just I was messing around with it, and I wasn't even blowing the thing very hard. I, I couldn't blow it very hard. I already had had gotten blood blisters on my lips again, and yeah. and I, they were all chapped up and everything, and <laughs> and, and I, I couldn't blow it very hard anymore, and and I was just. I was about to just throw the thing in the, you know, in the corner. <laughs> well, I didn't, I wouldn't, wouldn't throw it anywhere. You know, carefully lay it. In, <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Uh, somewhere. And I, and I went and blew it again and I blew it gently. And oh my God, I hit the note. Now I hit one of the two notes. There's only two notes that work. And I hit one of them. And what was crazy I'm in my house in town. My dogs were sound asleep and they'd been hearing me doing all this squawking and, and everything. When I hit that note, all of my dogs jumped to their feet. Mm -hmm. I gave you chills. Yeah. It, Standing it, it, in attention. Yeah. And it was, it was crazy. I got I got chili bumps all over Man, me. Man, when you said that, when you said your yeah, dog jumped yeah. up, I got chill bumps. Yeah. It's like a porcupine on my arm right now. Yeah. Wow. I mean, oh, they jumped up. And so I said, oh, my God, I don't need to be doing this here at the house. So I took the thing to work with me. And I would wait till everybody went home after, after dark. I mean, you know, at the end of the day. And I would go locked myself in one of the empty offices and I practiced with it. And I got where it, it still took a lot of work to get those, to one of the either, either one or both of those two notes. And I finally got where I could hit them, hit both of them. And then we, uh, I, the first time I wanted to try it, this is crazy in the field. And I was, I was scared to go by myself. I mean, I've, I've, most of my research has been done by myself over the years, but I was scared to go out there by myself because I didn't know what was going to happen. So I got together uh, three or four guys from up in uh, research buddies I had up in, in Iowa. And we went to a place where that I had been about five or six years earlier just out rooting around, you know, researching there in, in Iowa. And uh, it was not too far from a government facility. And I had made a couple of calls there on a gravel road out freaking in the middle of nowhere, no houses around anywhere. And, and I got run out of there by the boogers. I mean, they, they had sounded wow. off and come from a couple of different directions. And, and, uh, uh, anyway, so we went, you know, we went to the first place and I was so excited and, and, and wound up about it. I sat there and, and tried to blow that thing for 30 minutes or so, 30, 45 minutes. And all I could do is get some kind of a sound out of it. Like somebody stepped on a duck, you know, or, <laughs> or uh, or uh, ostrich ripping gas or something, you know. <laughs> I, 
I mean, I don't know. It's, I couldn't get the right sound out of it. So, <laughs> we, so, we, so we drove down the road a mile or so and went down in this creek bottom. And buddy, down that creek bottom, if you were down in a, in a big, deep hollow at the very bottom. Hmm. And man, you talk about dark and everything down there. But about this time, the moon was beginning to come up over over the trees. And once the moon was coming up, you could you could see pretty good. And uh, so I got that thing out. And we just hung around down there for about about 30 minutes or so, being quiet, just listening. The The night was just very, very quiet. And so I got the shofar and I tried to blow it. And I actually got some sound, you know, some, some pretty good sounds to come out of it, but I couldn't still couldn't hit the right note. And then I, I remembered I've got to relax, just, just relax. And I sat there and I tried to relax and, and everything. And I got out on it again and boom, I hit the note. I hit one of the notes instantly. It's like you flipped a switch the woods all around us came alive. We started mm -hmm. hearing coyotes started raising canes. Boogers, boogers started hollering from three different directions. And I got out on it again. And this time I rolled from one note right into the second note perfectly. And the boogers went bonzo. And Shh. the coyotes got quiet. Now, this is what's crazy. All of a sudden, I started seeing something out in the road in front of us. And I just reached over and I flipped on my headlights of my truck. There was a big pack of coyotes. We're talking about about a dozen coyotes were coming out in the road and they were hunkered down and they were looking back over their shoulders behind them. They had their legs tucked, their tails tucked between their legs and they were whimpering. They came right up to us, and the whole pack laid down right in front of my truck. Whoa, uh, bro. This, this was, I mean, all four of us, or five, four or five of us, we were freaking out. And we didn't, uh, we're like, what in the world? And those, those coyotes were hunkered down. And they were like, they were trying to get flat and get low, but they wanted to be there close to us because I, I truly think that they thought we would protect them. And they, uh, they even uh, slowly over time ooched up closer to us. And they ended up being some within, you know, six, eight feet of us. And, uh, well, maybe not that close, eight to 10 feet of us. Yeah, that's but, still uncomfortably close for a bunch of coyotes. Yeah. Yeah, but and, but they weren't even looking at us. They were looking out away. And these boogers came in from three different directions, mm. fast and loud and just tearing through the through the forest, I mean just mowing stuff down. I mean it sounded it sounded like we had a a a, a bunch of runaway D5 caterpillar dozers or D6 caterpillar dozers, you know, tearing <laughs> the forest coming towards us. I mean, raising Cain. Man alive. And what's crazy, sure. they, they came up, they came so close to us that they could see us and then just slammed on the brakes. And there were a couple of us had thermals and we could see them clearly in the thermals. They came in to where they had clear view of us and it just, just stopped. And they stood there, all three different little groups. And they just stood there. And some of them were standing there just how they, they'll rock back and forth where they're sort of unsure of things. There's a few of them doing right. that, but most of them, most of them were just standing still, just staring at us. And I'm like, now what? You know? And no I didn't I didn't know what I had done. And and it was obvious they were expecting something. They uh, they stayed there for about 30, 
Well, the after about 30 minutes or so of standing there, a couple of them started to leave, but they were, they didn't all leave till about nearly an hour, about 50 minutes before all of them had, had, had gone. They, they never, they never made any, once they saw us, they never made another sound. They didn't huff at us. They didn't throw rocks at us. Nothing. They just stood there or there were some of the little ones that we could see that actually sat down on the ground, some juvies and stuff that we could see through the thermals. And uh, that's remarkable. But but they didn't, once yeah. they got there and could see us, they didn't move any further. They didn't go pace back and forth or anything. They just stayed there watching us. Once the boogers left, the coyotes got up and looked back at us and sort of, and it went trotting off down the road and it just disappeared off in the, off in the woods. And it's like, thanks guys for, you know, they actually looked back at us and, and actually had sort of a happy look on their face. Or if, if a coyote can have a happy look, my, I guess I can call it more of a, of a, of a relieved look because they were obviously very stressed when they came up there. So we're sitting yeah. there. The well, boogers like, came, uh, you know, like, I can yeah. just imagine them. They get riled up and they take off. You know, those coyotes are like, "What in the world?" Yeah. So we're just looking at ourselves. What just happened? And and they, we knew of another place within about a about a forty five minute drive where there was historically has been a lot of activity, and it's over on the. Uh, uh, on a backwater of the off the Miss, main channel of the Mississippi River, so we we took off over there, and we got there, and there had been a uh, a big flood uh, a year or two earlier that had washed away part of the levee, and there was a a road that uh, and now the the main Mississippi River levee down through there is about. 12 to 14 feet tall, something like that. And we got on the river side of the levee and there was a road that ran north and south along the base of the levee and eventually went to a, an area on a, on a, what used to be an island out there, but they had filled in a bunch of dirt. And, and first there were just, just modest cabins and stuff, you know, little weekend getaways. But then since I'd been there the last time, uh, they'd come in there and built this fancy gated community there. And uh, we pretty quickly ran afoul of the gatekeeper when uh, about 200 yards before we got to the gate, there was an area where it had washed away. Well, there was a boat ramp there. And I don't know what the deal was, but the, that was a, an opening in the in the belt of trees that were right along the bank of the river. Right. During that flood, the water must have rushed through there because it had washed away a big it had washed through about half of the levee there. I mean, the, the wall of the levee was still there, the full height, you know, 12 feet or better. At that point, it was about 12 feet. And, but it made this scooped out place in line with the, uh, with the boat ramp. It made a, just a unbelievable amphitheater. I mean, it was, it was, I'm like, wow, this is fantastic because you can see a couple of islands out there in the, in the river. And there had been reports from uh, commercial fishermen and stuff over the years of of encountering boogers out there when they were running their trot lines and stuff out there near those two islands. So that was one of the reasons I was wanting to go there because we had a sort of a buffer zone where they couldn't get right. so close to us. That sounds and, like a comfortable spot to do some squatching. Right. Oh, yeah. I hate to be one of those old boys running them trot lines, though. Could you imagine? Uh, no, <laughs> no that would be the last place I'd want to be is in that water if I saw one of those things. My yeah. goodness. But I, uh, I have, I've been screamed at by boogers, you know, while I've been out fishing several times and, uh, uh, it's, it's, and I've also had them follow me doing tree knocks every few minutes as we were, you know, fishing a, a particular, uh, narrow, but long lake, uh, we couldn't get away from it. And they were following us to <laughs> from the time we got there to the time we left. But anyway, that's back, back to the show far. 
All right, so I got the shofar out. We we waited for a while, and uh, I start. Uh, I make the first attempt to blow it, and I didn't hit the right notes at all. And I tried it three or four times. Here comes the gatehouse guard from this rich sub <laughs> subdivision out on, that's been built on out there. Yeah, <laughs> the pair won't know what we were doing. Yada yada yada. So I just. Uh, I looked him right in the eye and I says, I says, I'm calling up some Bigfoot. Do you want to hang around and watch? You're doing what? I says, yeah. I said, I said I'm call, calling the Bigfoot off of that island, those islands out there. Uh, and, you know, to come up, come out here, I want, we want to see them. And uh, I said, we're Bigfoot researchers. And uh, we count them. And, and I, and I sort of piled on some, some little bit embellishment. Fluffed it, I, fluffed I, it up a little bit. I said, yeah, I said, we've been keeping track of the Bigfoot population around here for decades. <laughs> and, uh, which, which uh, I saw, Tim, you rascal. And I said, and I said, I said, we know them all. And, you know, anyway, <laughs> I, I told the guy some kind of story. And the guy <laughs> keeps looking wild, out, or crazier, crazier at me. And finally, he finally he decided that, uh, that I don't want to be around these idiots. You know, I need to get out of here. And what was yeah. funny? He left, and we heard something a few minutes later. I swear, I think he closed the gate and locked it. <laughs> the hell yeah, he closed that gate and locked it. I, I, I would too. Yeah. <laughs> Calling up squatch. He said you're doing what? Either See, way, he uh, damn sure burned off, didn't he? Yeah. Well, well, the uh, the you know I have a rule, and it's uh, anybody that's heard me talk very much knows this room anybody that's wanting to get into bigfoot research and burn this into your into your brain and don't ever ever forget it when you go out into an area and i don't care if you're bigfoot researching i don't care if you're just going out to look at wild look at wildflowers or going on a hike yeah. or going camping picnic. but or a picnic if you're in if you're parking anywhere other than in your own garage or your own driveway you turn your vehicle around and you get it pointed out into a known safe getaway direction yeah because you never know what's going to happen where you're going to have to unass the area and i mean in a hurry i'm talking about open up an extra large super fast acting can of gone and get out of there <laughs> yeah. and, uh, uh, and, 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 it, and it doesn't matter if you're going dove hunting deer hunting and like i said mushroom picking uh uh, going to get on the tractor and combine your fields. You park your vehicle so that you can jump in that vehicle and crank it up. And it's pointed in the way out in a known safe way. So what we had done when we came in there is we went driving down that road past the boat ramp. Cause I wanted to see what was on down there and encountered this came around a little curve and encountered this gatehouse and a the guy there, so we turned around in front of the gatehouse and went back up to the, went back up to the, uh, to the boat ramp and, you know, parked just off the, the head of the boat ramp in case somebody came in there wanting to use it or something. And this is a wide boat ramp. It was wide enough. You could launch, you know, four boats at a, four or five boats at a time or, or, a, or, you know, you could beach something pretty good size there. Right. Uh, but, uh, I didn't want to block the boat ramp, but we were pointed the way out. Uh, that was a point I wanted to make. I so, bet it was. <laughs> and so, you know, the, the guard had seen us come there and turn around right there at the gatehouse. And then he, then he heard us up there making a racket. You know, I'm sure he probably heard us. You know, we were, weren't 250 yards away from him. And he probably heard us get out and or shut our engine off and, and, uh, and then I started blowing the blowing the show farts. So he came up there, you know, don't know what in the heck we were doing. And so, uh, like I said, I, he went when the the gate was open <laughs> when we got there. And I and like I said, we're pretty sure we heard him close the gate. <laughs> and, yeah. and uh, so anyway, so I'm I'm getting out there, and I finally, after about oh half a dozen or ten or so tries. I hit one of the notes and immediately I got an answer off the, off the, 
the island that was right straight in front of us. And and about 15 seconds after that, I got a pretty good whoop off of the island that was downstream, uh, probably another two or 300 yards. So I got on, uh, I blew it again. And this time I made a, another perfect roll from, you know, one, one of the notes to the next note. And both groups let loose hollering back at us. And we started hearing a bunch of splashing in the water. Now this the island that was closest to us was still 200 yards out into the, into the, uh, into the river. And, uh, we started hearing a bunch of splashing out in front of us. So at this point, we hadn't even, the, the night was so bright at this point. <laughs> My we, hadn't, Lord. <laughs> we hadn't even gotten our thermals out. So we grabbed our thermals and fired them up and looked out there. And here's like six boogers wading out towards us. <laughs> My and, goodness uh, gracious. And it turns out there was a big sandbar or mud bank or something out there. Uh, off of that island, but there is a channel, a, a channel of deeper water there. And, uh, and they came out, uh, once you got about a hundred yards out from the island, there was a channel of water. Now at this point, the adults were about crotch, uh, crotch deep or so in the water, yeah. you know, which would have put the water about four foot deep, you know, maybe, you know, maybe four and a half, possibly five. Wow. And you could tell the, some of the smaller ones, they were either being carried or they were in water that was about chest deep on them. And uh, so, but they came no out to what I found out later on was the edge of the, was right to the edge of that mud bank. And, uh, and, where, and it dropped off into about, about 15, 16 feet of water. Now, I began to get worried we started, uh, I asked one of the guys, I gave him my thermal. I said, I said, you watch those things. I said, you, for any of those big ones <laughs> slip off in that water, you sing out. Because we need to keep track of, the, track yeah, of them. Yeah, you better warn me, damn you. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> and then, but the scary part was, was all of a sudden. It was all scary. One, one, of, the other, one yeah. of the other guys, the other guy that had a thermal, He's looking downstream towards that other island, and he he, uh, he says he says they're popping up out there. <laughs> and, Man alive! And they had apparently swam a pretty good distance and then popped up out there on the edge of that same mud bank, but a uh, maybe a couple of hundred yards downstream, maybe 150 yards downstream from the first ones that came out there. But interesting thing about that, the only ones we saw there in that second group were just, it looked like they were, you know, pretty much, you know, they were, looked like older GVs or, or, uh, and adults. We didn't see any, we didn't see any small ones and, uh, through the thermal. Of course, hmm. they were, that was far enough away that my thermal wasn't, didn't have very good resolution at that range. But one of the thermals, the, the thermal the other guy had, he had a, you know, one a couple of three thousand dollars, you know, and that thing you could see really good, and there were no little ones with with those, and there were only like three or four of them, if I remember right. Same thing. That, 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 that's fast. That, that's it's, I, I, I gotta ask this real quick. I mean, I hate to. I'm not gonna, uh, you know, yeah. cut you off at all, but their hearing. I've always wanted to ask you, how good do you think their hearing is? I think their hearing is absolutely fantastic. I think their hearing is what ours would be if we hadn't uh, spent a large part of our life listening to music too loud. Led Zeppelin and, and Pink Floyd and all that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and shooting and, guns. And, and shooting guns. On construction sites. Working on yeah. construction sites, being around steam lines and steam line right. brakes, sirens, and you know all kind of stuff. All that noise pollution. Yeah. Being out on te test ranges, blowing things up and... Uh, you know, making homemade bombs when we were kids. Yeah, having lots of fun. <laughs> oh, you you did that too. All right, I thought I was. I thought oh, I was. Yes. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I've, I've, so I've and, and that so far, just hearing it, it's piercing. It, it was a whole lot louder than I thought it would be. 
Yeah, it's it's oh, uh, yeah. It's yeah, that's what's Super amazing loud. is is when you hit the right notes, how loud it is, and uh, even though you're right. not blowing it real hard. But uh, anyway, so we're sitting there doing like we did before. Just they're watching us. We're watching them. And one of the guys, he came easing up next to me, and he grabbed a hold of my left shoulder or my left upper arm, and he he squeezed my arm. And I looked over at him, and he and he <laughs> did with his thumb, gave me with his with his uh, with his thumb, and giving it up, you know, looking back behind us. And he says, and he turned and looked back here. I turned around. And literally, he could have spit on top of our heads. There was a there was a big alpha male standing up there on top of that levee. Literally, six his toes were six feet above our heads, standing there, look just glowering down at us. Water wig nightmare. Time to get some yonder. And <laughs> no, I. Uh, he had us. I mean, if he wanted us, he had us. Oh, yeah. And what we did is we just walked out slowly out, front, slowly out <laughs> to the lip of across the road and onto the upper part of the boat ramp, all the while trying to keep track of the ones that were out there in the water. And that dude just stood there looking at us. Yeah. And he, uh, now, uh, after about, I don't know how long he'd been there, but after about 15 minutes, he turned around and walked away where we couldn't see him anymore. But we could hear him walking away, and he stopped. So he didn't go far. But he, uh, I think he could still see us, but we couldn't see him. And like before, after about 30 40 minutes, the other ones out there in the water started going away. And uh, so we didn't go any more places that night. And we were just, at this point, we were all sort of emotionally drained. Uh, yeah, I imagine and, so. And I, I, uh, I was trying to, you know, think, you know, what, what have we done? What did they want? What were they? I knew that they were wanting something from us and you know, what did they want? And mm. I, uh, I knew they weren't coming to attack us. If they were, we'd have been dead. I mean, they'd have, they'd have yeah. overrun us at the first place. Cause there was, so, yeah, times over. you know, what was, what was really baffling was the fact that the obvious that, I mean, I felt it, and I knew it from researching there before, that at the first place, those were three separate family units, three separate troops. Ordinarily, you get three troops like that, or you get even two troops like that in that close proximity, there's going to be a fight. Absolutely. That's why I asked about their hearing, because I've never right. seen that many troops that close together. I never run into no, I, I've, I've never seen. I witnessed one time two two big alpha males in a fight and uh, uh when i was deer hunting i was and i was t i was terrified to even come down out of my stand until and and i was the 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 the, the force and the destructive of that uh, uh, ness of those two alpha males fighting was just uh, absolutely unbelievable and i mean they they yeah. tore out a they destroyed the woods in an area an area probably 50, 50 to 70 feet across. And uh, I mean, just they were ripping, they were ripping six inch diameter trees up out of the ground and, and trying to hit each other. With it. And, uh, That's great. And, King Kong versus Godzilla. Right. And, uh, but, uh, and that, that one that was behind us uh, when we went down there, or excuse me, when we went down there to the, to the boat ramp, if, if there'd have been any ill and ill intent at that point, they, uh, we would, he would have killed us. I mean, we had no idea he was there and he was, he could have just stepped off and he'd landed right in the middle of us and he could have snatched our heads off 
before we could have said dad gum it. And, uh, and the, mm. and the, the, the two out there on the river that came off those islands, there had actually been in some of the reports that I had seen or in one report I had seen was that, that they were screaming back and forth at each other. And, and I sort of got the idea that they were, you know, sort of reluctant neighbors and, uh, <laughs> those, two, those two troops, but uh, anyway, that that uh, like I said, I, I went back to Missouri, and you know, and my my Iowa buddies went back to their respected homes, and we talked about that stuff several times over the next several weeks, and and uh, so I've been looking at scripture and stuff. And I used the shofar down in Oklahoma. Yes, sir. Uh, you guys want me to tell about that. Uh, it, yes. And I'll pick up where, where you guys took off. Cause wow. We, uh, we went to a, uh, let's just say a public, a public area. And, uh, in central Oklahoma, and we found a place that was down away from any campgrounds and stuff like that, where I could blow it safely without, uh, you know, without disturbing people. And I was having trouble with it and I fought it for probably 20 minutes. And finally, uh, uh, for about only about one, uh, a second to a second and a half, maybe two seconds, I hit the right note. And instantly, we were on the south side of a square 40-acre field. And any of you farmers out there, you know that if you go from one side of a 40-acre field to square 40 to the other, it's 440 yards or 1,320 feet. It's a quarter of a mile. It's a quarter of a mile across a, a, a square 40 acre field. And instantly on the north end of the field, we were against the south end. We got, we got a, a, an answer. And I blew it and I, and I was able to hit one of the notes again, just briefly. One of the guys with us had a really good, uh, really good thermal that could that could reach that far and we saw that there were two of them that appeared and one of them started around the uh, east side of the field and the other one started around the west side of the field which the west side of the field was a creek bank was a creek bank and again these two came till they got where they could both put eyeballs on us and they just stopped uh, they didn't come any closer and again, they stayed there 30 minutes, 30, 45 minutes, and then just wandered off back into the woods. Uh, we tried it at a, another location and uh, on a different trip out to Oklahoma. And we were on a backwater of the Red River. And we found where a... Uh, public road uh, crossed this this skirted around along the edge of this backwater and we stopped on the edge of this little causeway and I got the shofar out and we got quiet and after a bit and I blew it and I got lucky and I hit the right note about the second or third try and the woods came alive we ended up surrounded out on this causeway. We ended up having basketball sized rocks. Uh, big, if y'all know what rip wrap is, uh, for oh, yeah. people that don't know, rip wrap are, are big chunks of rock that the smaller pieces are about six inches, inches in diameter. They average about bowling ball size to basketball size, and some a little larger. Man, and they. Wow. And they stack them along. They'll they'll put it along the side of a of a causeway or a river bank or a creek bank or something to keep it from eroding. Those rocks 
that rip rap rock uh, prevents the, uh, the ground behind it from eroding so badly. So there was, there was some willows, little will, wild willow bushes that uh, growing along one side of that, that, uh, that causeway. And there was one that got out into the water. We could hear it and we were getting glimpses of it. And it was behind those willow bushes where we couldn't see it very well, but it was picking up large pieces of the riprap and throwing them up there near us. Now, imagine uh, rocks, the size, small ones the size of large cantaloupes, large ones a little bit bigger than basketballs, coming, launching up out from behind these willow bushes, and then arching over the causeway and hitting the water out there about, you know, 10, 15 feet off to our side. And, uh, you know, the big rocks probably weighed 80, 90 pounds, something like that. The big rocks, the big rocks weighed how much again? I'm sorry, I'm kind of hard to hear. Prob probably 80, 90 pounds, maybe the big. God ones. almighty, that's a yeah. boulder. And, is, I didn't know what this causeway was until y'all just explained. I've, yeah, I mean, in Oklahoma, yeah. we don't have things of that nature. Yeah. Well, you do. You just don't know. I, I know. I, just don't, I figured we did. Yeah. I just never well, did. Do. Oh, you call them something else, probably. Probably. But, uh, anyway, this thing, uh, uh, you know, we actually caught a few of them in our, in our lights because as they were throwing these things, we were sort of getting worried. And we realized, oh, One of the things that happened is I think they brought the largest tree in the world, which I think is the General Sherman Sequoia tree out of, from California. They, they drug that thing. They planted it right out there on the side of the riverbank. And uh, I don't know. We heard, we started hearing this really loud snapping and uh, of limbs breaking or the trunk of a tree breaking or something. And then we started hearing this thing falling. It's like, and it just, it just went on all of a sudden, boom, it hit the ground <laughs> back off. in. we couldn't see it, but it was within, it was less than 200 yards from us. It's probably only about 125, 100, most likely it's no more than 150 yards from us. It hit the ground so hard, and this is such a ginormous tree, it shook the ground where we were standing. And I've heard a lot of trees being pushed down when when we're when we were messing with the boogers and uh or when we were in you know booger territory and they're just doing it as sort of a warning. I've never heard anything that even remotely compared to that. Hmm. And we realized that uh, we realized that more and more of them kept showing up, and at, at the right from the beginning, we knew there were three over in this one area, and then there was obviously at least one back behind us to the northwest. I mean, to the northeast, and then we realized that there was one straight across this uh, this backwater uh, that was uh, to the south of us. Nice. Then, we realized, <laughs> then we realized that there were two to the east of us. And then we realized that there was an, another one that had showed up back to our west. And uh, yeah, see, that made me nervous. And they, they were getting louder and uh, and they were coming closer. Then I just happened to notice, I thought that the water where we were was real shallow and that we didn't have to worry about them swimming and you know sneaking, sneaking up on us. And then I noticed we just, I, I walked up to uh, my buddy Wade Parker's Hummer and I was, well, I was walking from my truck to Wade's Hummer. I looked down and there was a big culvert that went through the causeway. And the water... And that's, there happened to be a, an old creek bed that came through there. And I shined my light down to that water, and I realized that water was at least seven, eight, 
I, I mean, I could see down in there. The water was amazingly clear. You know, uh, I could see down in there, you know, six or seven feet, and the water went on deeper than that. And I realized that any one of those big, those boogers that were right there on the waterfront, they could slip off in there and, <laughs> and, and they could, they can swim. They can swim over a hundred yards underwater. I mean, I've witnessed it myself. And, I've uh, heard you say that before. And I mean, their lung yeah. capacity, hearing them yell, that's extremely believable. I bet they could swim a whole lot longer than that. I've heard that they can swim over, over 250 yards underwater, but I believe uh, it. But I've witnessed them swim over a hundred yards underwater. Yeah. They would have got uh, twenty yards, and I would have got some yonder. Uh, yeah, that had to be creepy. But I realized that we were in an indefensible position. That if one of them wanted, at least half of them could have slipped into the water and gotten to that old that creek channel and swam right up, right up to that uh, causeway and snatched any of the causeway was very narrow. And they could have popped up and snatched us right off that causeway and it wouldn't have been a thing we could do about it. Hmm. So so we left. We decided to leave. So we piled into our vehicles. And uh and I was uh I was riding in uh Wade's Hummer with him and my buddy Jim Sharp was driving my truck and uh we had Kurt Moser strapped down to the hood. Of, of my truck. <laughs> as a, the great Kurt as Moser. A, yeah, as a, as a sacrificial offering. To, <laughs> you know, I don't believe it for one minute. Take him and... <laughs> no, just kidding Kurt's that. got 10 tons <laughs> of sand in him. <laughs> yeah. I think I think that little boy could have whooped every one of us <laughs> under the right oh, and, and, <laughs> and not drop the bead of sweat. <laughs> yeah. You got to meet Kurt. Kurt Kurt's, uh, see, we'll, we'll tell that at the very end. Yeah. But anyway, so we were leaving out of there, and we had our windows down as we were leaving. And as we were leaving, about a about a softball-sized rock came whizzing right over the top of Wade's Hummer, and he heard it coming. It came from the driver's side, and it went over. I heard it go go past us, and whop hit a hit the trunk of a tree on right on uh, right off the side of the road on. Uh, on the uh that would have been i guess the south side of the road but uh but uh you know they gave us that parting shot as we left but again <laughs> if they if they have wanted to hit us with a, one of those rocks they could have and see but, that's what gets me tim they they it's almost like they have a terrorist campaigns that they'll launch on you you know yeah. what i mean like, like i think mm -hmm. they would rather terrorize and harass than actually yeah. lay harm to people right so I've used I've used that show far in uh, Alabama, Mississippi, Missouri, uh, uh, Oklahoma, Texas, uh, I know I've used it more more places. I think I think I took it to Louisiana, uh, uh, Arkansas. Uh, Arkansas is thick with these things as well. Oh boy, are they ever! And uh, I said Oklahoma. Yeah, Oklahoma. Uh, you can say Iowa. Oklahoma twice. Yeah, Iowa. <laughs> uh, I've used it in Iowa, uh, Illinois, uh, hmm. Kentucky. Wow. And how Tennessee. Did, how, how did you and have Kentucky and Tennessee? Uh, same thing. They 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 come and then they just they get there till they can see us and then they just stop and they just wait around for a while and then they then they leave. Uh, so I've you need I've been do, I've been doing a lot of studying of trying to figure out what's going on. I found some very disturbing scriptures. Uh. And I found them in two different places. I found some in the in the Book of Enoch. I found actually I found them in three different places. Found some in the Old Testament. I found some in in Revelations. Uh, 
back. Let me go get my Bible. I want to read the Revelations one. I'll be right back. Yeah, and I, uh, the the um, yeah. there's another one in Revelations that uh, we, we were talking about this the other night, and uh, he didn't really realize, and, no, and nobody really does because it's one of those scriptures that's kind of tucked in there. You've heard me read it a lot, folks. When that pale rider rides, and that pale is chloros in the Greek, Greek meaning green, or I'm Greek meaning green, chloros meaning green. That that makes it a green horse. The indication of which being is, uh, I mean, the, the the death rider is riding through or with nature itself, with creation. Um, and it makes me think of all this, you know, big all this green initiative and stuff like AOC's. Yes. Uh, Stuff you know, it's all a bunch of communist crap. And uh, yeah, they, and they worship Gaia. They're they're pagan heathens, right. exactly. earth worshippers. Uh, but at the top, we know that they're Satanists. And right. Satan's bride, uh, the, the what they call the Queen of Heaven, she's got many names, but one of them is Gaia. And they want to perpetuate. See, they think that they can force God's hand to do something, like He doesn't sit outside of time and space and control all reality with just His being. But they, somehow they think they can flim flam God, Tim. I'll, I'll never understand it. Yeah. All right. Now, this uh, this is uh, Revelations chapter six, verse eight, verse eight. And I want to read it the way it actually, like I said, what is what is a uh, is translated as a pale horse. Like I said, it actually. Uh, some people say that, that that pale meant that it was a sick horse, and you know that that could that, that that's got got a little bit of traction too. But it also <laughs> translates as a green horse. And I want to read that. And and I look, I looked, and behold, a pale, a green horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. Now, yep. you go back and you 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 go back and, and uh, chase that backwards and you come up with a... Uh, that same beast in the yeah. in the in the uh, Old Testament. Yep, and it says uh, I can't remember exactly where it is. It's Genesis uh, three. We we uh, we went through it the other night through Scripture. Yeah, when you okay. trans when you transliterate that word beast back from the Greek to the Hebrew, uh -huh. it's right. it's the same beast that appears in the garden, and that's not a beast of burden. It was the most no. subtle of all the beasts of the field, that serpent. Well, a, it also. If you look, if you study the Nephilim and the uh, and the the uh, if you study the Nephilim, there is a there's some pretty clear scripture that you know that it's one of it's some of that scripture that that is folks like to just sort of skip over it and act like mm -hmm. it's not there. But and, and I can't remember the the actual verses now, but it, it spe very specifically says it talks about that that these beasts are compelled, and when they when they're talking about they're talking about the nephilim and the descendants of the nephilim that they are compelled to respond the the to the voice of the of of God and the voice of God is this show particular so far and in the end and at the at the end of days that they will be summoned that they will be that they will be called and then they will be loosed upon the earth to kill us that not they us, are one us. Of, the wicked, well, the wicked the, yeah the, the wicked correct and they will in the first part if you if you study the the end times and stuff they say in the first round of of Armageddon or whatever or the the end 
that a third of the population of the earth will be wiped out. And then in the second part, which there's a lot of debate on when the second part comes, then another yes. third, another third of the population of the earth will be killed. At least killed in the in this mortal life. And then there will be a third that's still left here on the earth. Uh, but a lot of these old scriptures, you know, ancient, and we're talking about pre-Hebrew now. We're talking about, you, you got to go back into the Aramaic uh, and some of the ancient Greek. Uh, it specifically talks about these uh, these these beasts that are that are basically ne you know nephilim, and that they will that at some point now, and I don't know who this is that turns them loose. And I think it may be you know an angel. It's our captain. Or Either that, or yeah. it's our captain. Uh, in Daniel, it talks about a portion right. of these were left back for Jesus uh, to use in the end time. For right. God's wrath. For God's right. wrath. Right. And the you day. remember that scripture I showed you the other night where it was talking about how if somebody walks contrary to him, that he would walk contrary to them. And the beasts of the earth would be, yeah. That's right. The beasts of the beast earth. The beasts of the earth. Yeah. Right. And uh, all throughout the Bible, you're right, Kumbo. People see yeah. that, we read it, and we just skip over it and with it, like it doesn't have any significance because it's not here. Right. Well, yeah. The, what I learned from all this, I've, I've come to the conclusion that um, that they are when they come, when I blow that shofar, they come expecting to be loosed upon the earth. Mm. Yep. That's what they're expecting. That's why they come. They are they they have to come. They cannot not come. They are compelled to come. And then when they come, they are expecting to be loosed upon the earth. They're expecting an angel, Jesus, someone to say, get them boys, you know, more or less. Yeah. Get and, em. Yep. Yeah. Sick them, get them, you know, and, no, and because I'm of sorry. that, because of that, I'm not blowing the shofar anymore. Now, I got a question and I, and I, yeah. and I understand that, but, mm -hmm. And I have a few questions. Then it's just I'm, you know right or wrong answer, but I want your opinion on it. What if yeah. an unbeliever? Because I mean, all, all the men I, I, I know one gentleman that you named um, that when you originally went out there. But what if an unbeliever blew that show far the correct way? And they, I, mm. brother, I don't think that they would just stop and sit there and wait because if you think about it, no. you have the Holy Spirit, Tim. You have you have the creative force of God living within you. Mm -hmm. What if somebody did that and they didn't? I don't think they would have just stopped. I think that they would have. No, I don't know. Unfortunately, there's been since since we since I talked about it publicly and and uh, which was probably a big mistake. There's been another. There have been a number of people that have played with it, played with shofars, and. I don't know if anybody's had the the stick to it in this and the the patience to dig through, spend the years digging through that I spent, because my my old research buddy and I decided that we were not going to share we were not going to share this so, the, a lot of the source of our information and we were not going to share other things that we had learned in this in this long search. Uh, we were going to keep that to ourselves. Uh, but I think there are people out there that I know that I believe there are some unbelievers out there that, that have, that have shofars, uh, but they just don't know how to, how to blow them. I mean, Thank they, God for that. They get, they're getting sounds out of them, but they don't know what they're looking for. Yeah, they might yeah. get the winning lottery ticket. Yeah, uh, yeah, I don't think that'd be the winning one if they're an unbeliever, bro. I feel that in my bones. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah they. Uh, but Greg, uh, I know one thing. Greg said, uh, 
uh, my buddy Greg Howe said later, I mean, some time ago here in, in chat that when you hit the right note, you know it instantly. There is yeah. no doubt. Yeah. And, uh, uh, I had to figure out what the right note was. And then, and me not being a musician, it was yeah. very, very, extremely tough to, to, to know what to do to try to hit it. And, uh, and, uh, you know, with, yeah, with, as a musician, uh, when you, you know when you hit the tonic. When right. you blew when you blew that thing down in Brown Spring, Tim, there was a yeah. there was a feeling that came along with it. I don't know if anybody else felt it but me. There was um, a what? There was a feeling. There was there was something that I could feel that came along with yeah. it. Now, I wasn't I wasn't hypnotized like these animals or whatever, but um, right. There was definitely. It, it, I've I've been a musician my whole life. Came from a family of musicians, and there's definitely something when you hit those notes. Like me not even knowing what the right notes are because. Uh, you blew it a couple of times, but yeah, there was there was a, a, a definite distinct feeling that came along. And um, yeah. you have to leave because of the storm. And uh and I felt like, you know, I just won the lottery. You trusted me enough to allow me to um lead some of your guys through there. And brother, yeah. that was one of the and this is daytime, folks. This wasn't, you know, uh, uh the middle of the night. It was early evening, sun was in the sky. And we were shadowed through there and they, mm -hmm. they just, I won't say it's unusual behavior, but they were, it was, uh, it was a little bit more, it was a little bit closer than what I was comfortable with dealing with, even going out there by myself. And, um, there wasn't aggressive, but they definitely tried to get close to us. Right. Now, I, I, I don't know if that's because they didn't see where, who, who had blown it or they were trying to check us out and see, Hey, wait a minute, that's our human. But, What's going on here? What was what was that noise? You know, uh, but it, I, I find it extremely interesting that when you blow that show far, and especially there's a litany of verses you can refer back to. You're absolutely right, right. But when, when again, nature itself, creation itself, responds to it um, in that type of ver like veracity, where they're coming in there, yeah. you know, about face, and right. There, there's and something another, to that. You're right. And another thing, they were. They weren't coming in there to to because where you went, where where you guys went after I left, by golly, they had I mean, if they'd wanted any one of y'all, there'd have been nothing you could you could have been standing there with a bazooka in your hands and you would have wouldn't have been able to you know say no. Yeah. I mean, there's there is no weapon, no weapon that can be carried by by people that would have Unless it was a handheld nuclear device of some kind, and your, <laughs> and your, and your thumb was on the, on the button. <laughs> and, and, and you know, I've been in there forever. Like, and uh, at that point in time, I think it was like three, four years, uh, and that that was the primary area that I'd been to. And and, yeah. and I want to do this before I forget. I would like to offer an apology to Mr. Tim Kumbo Baker. Um, you don't owe me apology for anything. I, I, sure, I do, uh, because you know, I, I even back. When you were with the outlaws, you I, in hindsight twenty twenty, you were giving me sound advice, and um, and encouragement, and, and, and uh, against all odds, you know what I mean. Um, so I I, I I apologize for not having the discernment to see it at the time. Um, well, but, well, but yeah, I really do appreciate all the uh, I mean the good advice and and because I mean I look up to you as a mentor. And you've always been very, very gracious with your time. I, it, it could have been in the middle of the night when we heard those coyotes get ripped apart. I called you and you, uh, we talked for almost an hour. Yeah. 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 I just remember first time I finally got to meet you in person. <laughs> yes. Uh, Good old you, Yes, sir. We went to the, <laughs> we get, we went and, uh, did our, uh, paid our homage at the altar of, of the sublime altar of the Whataburger. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we made our offering. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is phenomenal. But, uh, but I knew right then you was good folks. <laughs> I appreciate that. Likewise. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, yeah, you're, you're one of the most upright men I've met in this field. Unfortunately, there's not uh, another dozen of you. And, and folks will tell you, uh, 
I, I'll say if there's ever a Bigfoot University and you're not the headmaster, it'll be closed down within a week. Uh, uh, I don't know about that. I just, well, I, do. <laughs> I mean, there, there's, yeah. there's folks, there's folks out there that, that know just as much about them as I do. And there's, and there's some that I know. In fact, he's on here. He's on here tonight in chat. He was anyway, that knows, knows more about him in some areas than I, than I do. I mean, he knows yeah, but you're a very more honorable man. You're a yeah, very, you, honorable, yeah, very honorable, honorable man. Well, this guy's an honorable man too. You know, but yeah, there, that's the thing. Uh, uh, you know, your whole crew was phenomenal. Your whole there, crew was very, very great people. Well, any, I've said it a thousand times, any researcher worth his salt, number one realizes that there is, there's no ex, there's no experts in this field. Anybody that says they're an expert, they're a liar there because Amen. the more, you know, the more you realize what you don't know. Yeah. And the more, you know, the more questions you have. Absolutely. And there is, and the other thing is, any researcher that's worth his salt has got to be willing to go back and relook at his data and got to be willing to, to change his theories that he had based on new evidence and, and new data. And I know I went for, you know, taking, going out and taking, you know, reports and stuff like that for six years before I ever realized that there was really such thing as a dog man. And then I had to go back and re-interview some people. Uh, and <laughs> that's that integrity. That's that integrity. And it's rare in this field. Yeah, and I know you've you've seen it too. It's in, it's unfortunate, Tim. Yeah. That there's a lot of people who would who want to sway instead of using the cold hard facts and the data that they've gathered. Yeah. They don't want it to be if, if it's something other than what they thought it was they will alter or sway the evidence in the way in which they like. And that's not scientific whatsoever. Um, Correct. Yeah. It got to the point where I'll, I'll stop calling myself a field researcher because uh, I was, you know, I had a bunch of notebooks and they're all gone, you know, um, but, <laughs> that's uh, what yeah. tells me. I had, I used to keep these journal books. These big, yep. you know, I used to buy these journals and they were yep. hard bound. They had 200 pages in them and they were, you know, college ruled on both sides and the pages were numbered. Yep, that's that's exact same had, thing I had. I had six of them, completely full, and and was working on a seventh. And it's my fault I lost them when my first wife and I uh, divorced. I had a we had a big built-in entertainment center, and half of it was stuffed full of my journals and just gobs and gobs of videotapes, boxes wow. full of photographs. Uh, mm. A lot of a lot of audio recordings, just gobs of stuff. And back then, we used to do we used to modify uh, VCRs, stereo VCRs, to record, uh, and we recorded audio rather than video on them. So it was it was a poor man's oh, wow. poor man's digital audio tape. And I had piles of of uh, six hour videotapes. And uh, that I hadn't even listened to yet, and uh, to see what I'd caught on them, and uh, and I and I had those those six full journals, twelve hundred pages of sighting reports, and uh, and I screwed up, and I didn't I didn't get over there fast enough. Was they sold the house? And she didn't have any choice. She had to get all that crap out of the house. She threw it out, out on the street. So wow, yeah, I went my through fault. the exact same thing. Uh, oh, <laughs> so I know, how, I know how it feels. You know, especially when you put so much time and effort into it. And and yeah, uh, but that's what that's when I just stopped, started just wandering through there. You know, and having the experience and using yeah. the old uh, uh, noodle to remember right. as much stuff as possible. Because I said that's never going to happen again. Well, what kills me uh, is that you know, myself and uh, Big Dog T2B and some others were going to put together this big sighting database. In fact, we're still working on it slowly. Well, well Jack is. I haven't been contributing anything. 
Another great guy. Uh, <clears throat> but <clears throat> man, if we'd have had the if I'd have had those six full journals of sighting reports, it would have been awesome. Awesome. Yeah, man, awesome. imagine in the, the in database that, for in that the foundation database. for a database. Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh Greg Graham wanted me to describe a type four dog man. Where does it say? Yeah, we can we can get to the questions real quick. And I appreciate it. Uh All right. Tim, I knew when we got to talking we were gonna go past that hour. But uh, I, I yeah. sincerely appreciate your time, as does I'm, I'm guessing everybody else, because we had a yeah. had 75 people in here at one point in time. Hit that like button, folks, and uh, put your questions in all caps. I'll go back through and catch ones that we missed. Uh, okay. Uh, all right. I, I was the first one. When I started discovering that there were different kinds of them, you know, me being a an engineer, you know, I want to classify things, you know, I want to put them in a, in a, in a box, you know, and that's fine. <laughs> and, uh, so I, I fairly quickly learned that, uh, I know the ones we, that I grew up with here on the farm, they're the type one, the big, the big boogers, the, the, the patty type, like you see on the Patterson Gimlin film, the, the alpha males are 10 feet tall. In fact, well, I've seen one that was up to, most of them are around nine and a half, 10 feet tall. There are a few, very few, but there are a few out there that hit 12 feet. The, the 10 footers, uh, uh, Steve Wolf, he was asking about the pitches. Uh, it was a combination of that scripture plus a, this, uh, this, uh, uh, Hebrew mystic fella that uh, was a, you know, extremely deep scholar of, of the ancient, ancient scriptures and such. Uh, so uh, back to what I was saying. Uh, well, crap. What was I saying? <laughs> uh, let me go back up and find the question. You're, you're talking about the type for, you're explaining the type for. Oh, oh the uh, type, the types. Okay. Yes. All right. So the patty type is the type one. They're the, the males weigh, you know, they'll weigh 900 to 1200 pounds and the females weigh probably, you know, 600 to maybe 700, possibly even as much as 800 pounds. And, you know, they'll get up to about, you know, eight to maybe a max of about nine feet. They have plantigrade feet like we do. What plantigrade means is, is when they're standing up, standing still, their heel is on the ground. When they walk, their heel hits the ground every step that they take, just like ours do. Uh, the type two is what I call the Neanderthal type, or, and I'm not pronouncing Neanderthal correctly, it's Neanderthal, tall, I think. But I think the H is. Oh, so. that's a manic. Yeah, that's the. Just like but, Uranus instead of Uranus. Right. So, anyway, so the type two is the. Swamp ape type or uh, or Neanderthal type, and you can look up the book uh, "Them Plus Us" and look at the pictures of the Neanderthals in there, and lose the the vertical slit pupils and change the nose to be more of a human a human type nose, but a you know flatter, wider nose, but but more human type and uh uh and you've got you a type two booger males get you know eight to nine feet tall uh they'll weigh probably you know, maybe seven eight hundred pounds something like that the females six to seven feet uh they'll weigh you know 400 to 500 pounds but they're still Barrel chested, they don't have the big sagittal crest that the type ones have, like a gorilla. They have more of a rounded head, and uh, I call them pea heads. But they're but uh, pea heads. Yeah, but they're they're not really they're not perfectly. Then the heads are not perfectly round. They're well, it just depends. They they vary, but they don't have a big prominent sagittal crest as much as the type ones do. They also have plantar grade feet. In other words, their their heel hits the ground every step that they make when they're walking bipedally. 
Uh, you know, they're a little bit light, lighter built than the, uh, than the uh, type ones. They tend to be a little bit more belligerent. They can be more, a little bit more ill tempered at times on a, you know, than your average type one would be in a similar situation. Then you got the type three, which is the baboon headed ones. They also have plant, they have basically the body of the type two, but they've got a head that looks similar to a baboon. Some people can mistake those. I thought those were dog men for a long time. I did too. And uh, then I realized by fi finding their tracks that they had, they also have plantar grade feet, just like the type ones and the type twos and us. A lot of them, I think, I don't know if they could be the result of inbreeding due to the, to the drastic reduction in the, the nationwide uh, Bigfoot population when the white man came in and, and gave all these white, white man, European diseases to the, to the Indians and killed off most of them. They also killed off most of the Bigfoot. And I know that there had to be isolated pockets of Bigfoot that ended up becoming inbred. Hence, mm -hmm. we find uh, three-toed tracks are not uncommon. And that's a fairly common mutation in human beings that are inbred is ah. having as having there you're actually you, you've still got five toes, but sometimes a couple you know they'll be you'll have they'll be grown together. The right. skin will skin will cover uh, you know two fingers or two toes at a time. So you attribute so, that to a mutation from from inbreeding. I, that's one of the possibilities of it. Yes, I right, think. Yeah. I think that's the most likely possibility. Is is that a lot of these three-toed tracks you see are the result of inbreeding that's in that lineage, in that bloodline of that group, and it keeps popping up generation after generation. And that, we that see makes stuff, sense. We see stuff like that in humans, right? Uh, uh but. The type threes with the baboon looking head. I don't know if the if that weird head is the result of a, of inbreeding or is a mutation that resulted from inbreeding or if they're a distinct type. However, I do know this. And this is a fact that I've been able to prove uh, to the best of my ability in multiple locations. Uh these type threes are sort of, they don't really, there's a few places that they hang around a lot, but they, but a lot of them are, are, are mobile. They move around and they'll stay in an area for a year or two and then move on. I can tell you this, when the type threes are moving in, the two type twos and type ones that are in that area will move out. The type twos and the type ones don't want anything to do with the type threes. If you want to see what a type three looks like, there is a very good picture of it online that you can get. It's called the Beast of Seven Shoots. Yes, and that's that's a there's a that's a provincial park up in Quebec, Quebec, Quebec Canada, and Shoots is spelled C H U T E S, the Beast of Seven Shoots. C H U T E S, and you can you can look at that, and that that is a good picture. That's the best picture I know of uh, that you can find easily of a type three. And by the way, it's got a dead dog. It's got its lunch or it's got its supper under its arm. It's killed a dog, and it's got it under its arm. It looks like a uh, just a loaf of bread. Yeah. And that looks right. like a big bread. Uh, he's holding it in his hand. It looks like. Is that under his arm? Yeah, yeah. He's got. Well, he's got it. He's got it cradled in his arm. You know, like ah, I see. Toting, like he was toting a football Tot or a, or a watermelon. Groceries. Yeah, but you're, looks you're like looking a golden at, retriever. You, you're looking like yeah. It. You're looking at the back end of the dog. The tail is hanging down in in the front in in the front of his hand or arm. The head is hanging down towards towards its rear. You know, you have to look at it close. The, the pictures on the internet now are degraded quite a bit. There you go. Yeah, no doubt. 
there back when they when this thing first came out and the, and the pictures were fairly new uh you could you could see a lot more detail in the in the pictures uh but that that's unfortunately a dead dog that is carrying uh now and you look at the you look at the face and there's some zoom in you can find some zoomed in uh pictures of the face and you can clearly see the uh the baboon looking head on it. That thing's a uh, monster. Let's see if I can find yeah. better than that. One of the things that these things will do that type ones and type twos will not do, these type threes will break have the, the, it's documented that they have broken into occupied homes hmm. of, of, of people. Uh wow. I person I personally know a lady who had to abandon her home in Iowa when they they got they broke through the wall of, wall of her basement or actually they broke through a, a door uh, to get into her basement and then then busted up through the floor into her house and she had to abandon the house lord of mercy wow. and they are they're they they have a very evil aura to them and like i said the the type ones and type twos that are in an area, when the type threes show up, they leave. They, I it's mean, the, yonder. Yes, and if the when the type threes move on a couple of years later, your original boogers will come back, but they don't want those, anything to do with them. Yes, yeah, uh, those there goes the neighborhood kind of situations. Exactly, exactly. They. Uh, but I have seen, the, I type have seen it. the type threes. Yeah. When the type threes show up, the rest yeah. of the boogers leave. And, and the type wild. threes after a year, after a year or two or three, when they decide to, to leave and move on, once they're gone, the original boogers will come back. So uh, even the biggest type of Sasquatch will leave an area because of these. Right. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yep. Yeah. Glad yep. I ain't running into none of those. No, uh, no. See those damn type threes move in next door. Let's 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 look for another place to live. Well, uh a uh a friend of yours and mine, uh D, uh he's had a fair amount of experience with them out uh quite a bit ways west of you. Uh no kidding. Yeah, I have to talk we'll talk to you about it. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. On. Yeah, hopefully but, it's not in the great yeah. sooner state because uh yeah. But uh but anyway, they are in, in, when you when you find them, they're in a uh in the same area as a Oh no no no, yeah, you can keep going. I was I was just I'm uh, putting this up. This is going to be the next one up. Yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, I didn't mean to derail you. That's all right. Um but I have found I found these type threes in 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 Texas, uh, Oklahoma, Louisiana, mm. uh, Mississippi. Uh, obviously, they got them in Quebec. Uh, I'm talking about this, these are places where I've stumbled across them. Uh, possibly. In Kentucky, but I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not them in sure. Alabama. I, I nothing, that I, no, no. nothing that nothing that I can recall. Uh, none in Alabama. Now, yeah. on to the on to the type four. Now, the type four is what I call the true a true dog man. A lot of people mistake the type threes for dog men because they've got a a snouted head, you know, a snouted face. Yeah. Yeah. But they are, but a type three is not a dog man. Absolutely not. The, the type, does type three have a t uh, tail? No. It doesn't have a does, tail, right? Does not. Type four, that is what I call the true dog man. And again, I do not know if they have a tail or not. I only have seen one with my own eyes. And 
I couldn't tell if it had a tail or not. I was looking straight at it. It was facing straight at me. We weren't very far apart, but it was it was after dark. And my my uh, ditch lights, my my fog lights were only illuminating it from about uh, waist up. But the type the, these dog men, they have what's called plant, uh, digital grade feet, not plantar grade like us and like the types one, two, and three have. Digital grade feet means they walk on the balls of their feet like dogs and mm. cats and right. you know, a lot of other animals, you know, most other animals. Their horses, even they, even if they have hooves, they're still digital grade uh, because they're walking on their they're walking on their toes. You know, even on a, on a hoofed animal, their toes are fused together, and there's a and their fingernail over you know adapted and grew grew all together in one solid big nail, which is the hoof. And what used to be the fingers are sort of fused together. But anyway, back to the to the to dogs, it, their legs. People often say their leg, their knee is bent backwards. That's not the knee that you're seeing. No, what it's you're not. seeing is the hock. What you're seeing is the hock. Oh, yeah, of course. And if you if you look at look at your dog or your cat right now, and you see or stand them up, and you see that you got their back paw is on the ground, and the Leg comes up at an angle going towards the rear, and then there's a 90-degree turn. That 90-degree turn is the hock. That is the equivalent of the heel in humans and type 1s, 2, and 3 Bigfoot. That yeah. the, the hock is the heel. So they're walking on the ba balls of their feet with their heel up off the ground. Hmm. If you then once you go around the hock and go and you in an angles forward that next joint you find is their actual knee yep. or if you start feeling right there on their hip and then work your way down you'll feel down their their thigh and you find that joint that that as you're feeling down their hip you're got you're you're moving down and forward when you get to the knee then then you're then the bone there's a joint there and the bone will be below that which is their equivalent of our shin bone is in going wow. down, down and backwards. Yeah, but so curious, I have to call over. Uh, I have to call over Sweet Looney. You got me. Yeah, actually working along with you. So, huh. what you're looking at is, is, you know, people see it and they they think that their knee is bent backwards, but it's not. Their knee is bent normal, just like ours. What you're seeing and what you think is the knee is actually their hock, which is their heel. And they're, they walk on the balls of their feet. So when you find a, a true dogman track, what you're going to see, it's going to look like a, it's, it's not elongated like a dog track or a coyote track. It's, nope. it's wider than it is long. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you'll see, clearly you'll see claws. Another thing that has been seen often around the, I'm going to back up to the type threes. Some type threes have clawed toes. They have claws on the end of their toes. Not all of them, but some of them. The, the type threes, is it a possibility that they could be with genetically modified something or another? Because they don't seem, there's nothing about type threes that seems rational or natural to me they like you said they seem malicious or like they could be i mean there's a chance you you don't know i mean our government has right. been our government has been experimenting with genetic engine genetic engineering of mammals since World war the, II, right? uh, well uh, there was a lot of it went on Christ. in world war ii but the the uh the Soviets took it to a new a new level. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, Stalin's gorilla man. He's trying to genetically modify well, the mixed gorillas with actual I, men, and that. I'll tell you this, because I know you know. 
I, I know. <laughs> well, <They're> German shepherds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't tell a lot about. Uh, I'll tell you this. <laughs> See, I knew. I, I I know you knew. All right, but well, only what you can tell, of course. Well, I'm trying to think what I can tell without getting myself in trouble and some and other folks in trouble. Uh, a, an acquaintance after the when the Soviet Union fell, there was a huge rush into the former Soviet states to glean technology. Biomedical engineering and biological engineering uh, were two of the main things that they wanted because they knew that the Soviets were doing things, researched on things that were against the law in, in most of the Western world and, uh, or most of the, in most of our allies' countries. Uh, a, an acquaintance came back from one of those trips. I asked him if, and that was, I asked him if he found anything. He said, oh yeah. Hmm. And, uh, and I said, what'd you find? He said, you ever see the movie, The Island of Dr. Moreau? I said, yeah, I saw, the, I saw the original one with, uh, I think it was Spencer Tracy that was in it. And then I saw the uh, the later one that came out with uh, Val Kilmer and Marlon Brando in it. He says, okay, right. well, let me tell you, that ain't nothing. I'm on, I, in, in, a, in, a, in a greatly <laughs> paraphrased route. In a greatly paraphrased response, he said, well, if you saw that, that ain't nothing. Mm. That's, and that's, a, that's a big and statement. And it is. Right. And, and I, I kept an ongoing interest in this and uh, until uh, I got told to back off. Ooh. Back off, back off Buckwheat. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, beat it. Yeah, and, uh, take so, your increase uh, down the road. Yeah. So uh, anyway, I've Man. had that happen here a couple times in my career. <laughs> I, I bet you have. We got we. Me and you have the same curiosity about things. And, and I know and you're that, like pit bull, like I am with information. And, yeah. And yeah. What you're interested so, in, and that's another. Re and folks, y'all just heard that, right? Did it did not yeah. feel like you were in, in? In I'm told you the professor. That's why I call him that. Like the way yeah. you explain things, and even even complicated things, you do it in a way yeah. that's uh, that's collegiate. Yeah. Uh. But uh, red eyes at night doesn't mean they're angry. Doesn't well, it, it, red eyes it, it, red eyes shine from boogers doesn't mean they're angry. A lot I've of people think that they have the uh, um, the, the the like the fish at the bottom of the ocean. What do you call that? Uh, Bioluminescence. Bio, bioluminescence. Bioluminescence. Yeah, I don't know about that. That's that's what I can't. I can't. I am. Uh, I know there's a lot of people claim that that they've seen their eyes glowing when there was absolutely no ambient light whatsoever. A lot of people. But uh, I don't know. I don't know how that could work. I don't, I don't know. That's one of those things that. Then I just there's so many other things that's more important to me. <laughs> yeah. I, just, I sort of let that play. Yeah. Uh, one of these one of these years I might get around to it, or one of these years I uh, I've never I've seen plenty of glowing booger eyes. I've seen lots of them, but I've never seen I've never seen them when there wasn't at least some kind of. Ambi uh, ambient light source. A tiny little bit. I always thought because their eyes were so big that the lens behind them was massive yeah. and just yeah. a little bit of light would refract and make it look like they're glowing. Yeah. But Well, you know, I have seen my dog's eyes glow just from stuff reflecting off the lens of my glasses. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
I've got some pictures of I've got some pictures of my German shepherds, uh, and I'm pl I'm playing with them, and they're sort of they're hunkered down, <laughs> and their eye and and you all you can see is these three sets of glowing eyes, and by God, I'm telling you what it it, it looks wicked. <laughs> yeah, I bet, but, I bet it does. Yeah. German shepherd German shepherds themselves are kind of intimidating looking dogs. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, we're talking about eyes that are only, you know, maybe three and a half, four inches apart. So I ain't worried about them. You know, it's yeah, them no one, it's those ones that are <laughs> seven, seven, eight, nine inches apart that I worry about. Yeah, <laughs> those, those get, those get kind of ooky spooky. Uh, yeah. Just the, the casual nature that the one that was by your porch. I mean, we're just talking, chopping it up, having a casual conversation. And you're like, yeah. hold on, something out here is messing with my dog. Because it was going bananas. And, oh, yeah. Um, he You're was like, I think one's at the end of the porch. I was like, the end of the porch? What? <laughs> uh, he I couldn't was, imagine growing up with him. Old Joe was in full, he was in survival mode. He was he was trapped on that porch, and and he, he wanted in the house, and, and that booger was that booger was standing there staring at him and giving him the stink eye, you know? Wow. And, uh, and I think he, I think he was, I think he had bad intent. I don't, I don't think it was one of the ones from our our regular troop. I think it was one of the ones from our our uh, our snowbirds. <laughs> yeah, to be, our, to be that close our, to your house too. Like our winter wintertime visitors. Yeah, yeah. yeah the trouble is this, this this hedgerow that runs behind the house here has been a travel route for him for for decades, probably eight, probably centuries. The old farmhouse over here was built in eighteen eighty five and. Oh wow! You know, I, know there, yeah. I know there are people here way before then. There's been people living in this area, white people living in this area, since the 1820s. And wow, interesting thing, you know, we got a part of the farm, one of the hollows that on our farm is called No Head Hollow. And uh, I always thought it was called No Head Hollow because a lot of times when you see them walking away from you, especially if they're going downhill, sort of, or, or up a hill. You can't see their head; they're sort of hunched over, right. and you, you can't see the head. So it looks like they hadn't got no, hadn't got a, hadn't, you know, they ain't got no head. So I figured that's where <laughs> no head all came from. But, Makes uh, sense. One day, uh, there's a little cafe down the road here, about two miles that we frequent, and uh, we were in there one one day eating lunch, my wife and I, and and saw one of the elders of the of the area. He came in, and he was a you know a good friend of my dad's. He owns He's two farms to the west of us. And, and so I just asked him, you know, I said, I said, hey, you know, and I addressed him by his name. I said, he looked at me. He said, yeah, I said, you remember, you remember me? And he said, oh, well, you look familiar now. So I said, well, I'm Jerry Baker's son and, uh, and uh, oldest son. And he says, oh, yeah, I hadn't seen you in a, in a long time, you know, since you were just a kid. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, anyway, we talked a minute. I said, I just asked him, I says, Sir, do you have something I've always been curious about? I said, you got any wild idea how No Head Holler got his name? He said, yeah, exactly how it got his name. <laughs> he says, he said back when, uh, when folks moved into this area back in the 1820s and stuff that, uh, that, uh, somewhere back in there, they first settled that there were these two brothers and it's a weird name. Uh, there's a creek named after them. Uh, starts with a K. I can't remember the name of it. But uh, anyway, and if I try to on this slow internet, you called service, it the other night. Uh, was was it yeah, wasn't Google? Was it? No, it's something similar to that. It's Kasag or uh, anyway. It doesn't, it doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah, they, it was a European name, like a yeah. like a. Swedish or a Norwegian name or something like that. Right. Moved in here. And these two brothers, and one of them settled up at the head of the hollow where it, where there's a lot more flat ground and you could farm it. And the other one settled down. And this is back before the river was backed up like it is now, before the river's dammed up. He settled down near the mouth of the hollow where it opened out into a, into a bunch of bottom land, uh, in, in a in a larger hollow, and there was a little town here. They, the you know the little community had sprung up, and there was 
like some kind of a little trading post or something. And somebody noticed that they hadn't seen either one of these brothers in a in several weeks. A couple more weeks went by, and, and talk got up. You know, well, have you seen any of these? Any of these? Either one of these brothers? No. So one of the one of the locals said, "Well, I'm going to be going by near there on my way home. I'll just swing down in there and see if and check on them." Well, the first one he goes to is uh, the guy that's down at near the mouth of the hollow, uh, where it empties empties out into into a larger hollow, and uh, <laughs> uh, that 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 had a that that area down there is flat. You could you know, plant crops or whatever. Anyway, he goes down there and he finds the guy laying there with no head. His head has been ripped off, not chopped off, but ripped off. Lord of mercy. And later they, you know, later on they looked and looked and they never did find his head. He goes up the hollow and up near the head of the hollow where it, uh, where it sort of flattens out. He finds the other brother laying there outside his, you know, his home or cabin or whatever. His head has been ripped off. They eventually, when they were searching around, you know, looking, they eventually found his head, you know, a pretty good distance away from the, where they found the rest of his body. And that's how it got the name No Head Hollow. And what's interesting on maps that go all the way back in the, into the 1800s, if you follow No Head Hollow out and going towards the head of the hollow, where the hollow peters out, if you just keep going in that direction, which is pretty much southeast, you go up over a low ridge and you drop down into a big wide bottom. And that bottom to this day and its own maps is called Booger Bottoms. <laughs> wow yep that's right you couldn't, couldn't get any more on the nose and, and right. you see these all over the united states folks like yeah. nobody really looks into it nobody really uh, i guess looks into the history of their area i'm yeah i'm a local historian and i see things like that and i dig as deep as i can into it and you always find some sort of a tragic unsolved grisly death all right d d yes sir you remember the picture of the tombstone you sent me that you found? You yes, that? yes, sir, I do. Yeah, tell, killed tell by. Oh, all right, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. All right, here in a small town, not too far away from uh, uh, my hometown where I'm at right now, there's a tombstone that reads, uh, "Woman killed by human wolves." wolves. Yep. And hey. if, if you ask the locals, and and Tim can attest to this. You'll find only so much on the internet. You have to actually go put boots on the ground and knock on doors, and and hopefully you're from there. If not, nobody's going to tell you nothing. Now, what I heard is, it's, you, the people were saying they were road men or or road agents or whatever um, that accosted this woman and killed her. That's what I guess they told the travelers or whatever. The, the um, word on the local street though is that, that they were upright walking wolves. And uh, one was shot with black powder and uh, a black powder rifle, and it got away. But yes, these were what we call dogmen. Yep, human wolves. Yeah. But it's on our tombstone. All right, not too terribly far from you. And uh, you know our our friend uh, uh, Mr. Corbin. Yes, sir. You know who I'm talking about? I know exactly who you're talking about. Yes, sir. Uh, right out there where he's from. There are, uh, I've talked to people who live, who are from out there, and they've actually shown me uh, uh, what they claim are families of were werewolves out there. Um, and, and, uh, and, yeah. <laughs> and there are a number of reports from out in that area. Uh yeah. Of, That's what got me, Kumbo. Uh, 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 it's, we're, and, uh, and I uh, think, you know, they. I, what do you think? Be, I think it's real. It has to be. I don't know, man. Because he told me that story. I mean, I, <laughs> and you know, the area that he's from, my brother lived there, and I'd go there in the summertime. 
And this, I don't know if I've ever told well, you this. Well, I, I was, I heard this. I was researching out there decades before I ever met met him, and and I was ha, was hearing this stuff from a whole nother bunch of folks than than than. Oh no, than, kidding! Than our than our mutual friend. Oh yeah, absolutely. That's and, scary. Uh, there was this one family, my brother, like because they just got they felt they looked and felt off, and I I, I only seen them twice while we go and visit through yeah. the summers. And they just something they all kind of looked alike, and they and yeah. not like inbred. They just they had this uh, weird we, I don't know weird type of look to them. We don't have time to talk about it now, but my God, I had a my first time out there. I I had some hair raising experiences with some of these, and uh, Ooh. I, and I was glad to get my butt out of there. Let me tell you, that's one of the I don't, places, I don't blame that you. was a place that I was yeah. glad to, to be gone from. That whole part of the state's creepy, Kumbo. Like <laughs> that whole part of the state just got this uh, yeah. weird type of energy to it. Yes, it does. But ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have kept Mr. Kumbo an hour and thirty six minutes. <laughs> That's what we we're gonna do. I knew it wasn't gonna be no quick hour. We get to talk at, at the bit, and uh, I, I again, Tim, you're all you have an open invitation anytime you want to come back, and I'm sure the folks go on right. part two. Um, very very grateful for you jumping over and again this is the professor ladies and gentlemen if, if he if, i don't know anybody who uh is so willing and ready and uh, uh capable of sharing so much information in just one sitting yeah well and I, i'm still appreciative of it well t you know there's a lot of people out there that try to make a living off a of bigfoot and uh right and you know they go around you know, talking in all these conferences and everything. And uh, I've never, I've never earned a penny from anything Bigfoot related. And I don't care to, but, uh, but, uh, you know, I do this just for a quest for knowledge, you know, a quest for learning about them. And then plus I want to teach. I want to disseminate as much of that as I can, uh, but the, the thing is, I can't just go blabbing a lot of the stuff because it'll get people in trouble. Uh, right. Yeah. You know, you gotta, you've gotta sort of work your way in into a lot of this stuff, and you got to be careful what you're doing. Uh, you know, I, yep. I, I, you know, I, I had the incident where somebody was wanting me to tell about when I had one trying to get in my house and. You know, I, I accidentally pissed one off badly. And uh, I don't know what would have happened if he had been able to get in. Mm. But uh, don't I've had them, I had them right here when I first moved. When I, I moved in here in March of uh, uh, two years ago, this, this the next month will be two years I've been right here. And when I first moved in here, uh, you know, me and my dogs and everything, we sort of upset the good thing that the local bookers had going, and they let me know that they weren't were not happy for me being here. And, uh, yeah, man. They they came up here. I can take you right out here on the back of the house and show you where they punched the side of the house. There's still knuckle marks there, and, wow. and where they and where they drug their fingernails down down there. So you can still see the the scars on the siding. <laughs> and, I mean, they're the masters of intimidation. They are the masters of their. Yeah. Of their uh, absolutely, of their, of their domain, they'll get you out of there if they want you out of there, unless yeah. you just plant your feet. But, you know, it's there's so many things that uh, the more I learn about it, the more I realize how intelligent they are. And but they're yeah. some people have suggested they're similar to like oh, like they they exhibit some of the characteristics of autism. Uh. Possibly, I know one thing. They definitely exhibit some of the some of the uh, characteristics of OCD or yes. or yes. A, or a anal retentive behavior. Because, like the way they kill, the way they kill deer, and the way they they uh, well deer and dogs, the way they treat their their food sources and stuff, their their uh, mammalian food sources. They are. Now I've seen variation around the country, but the ones right here in this area right here, if you find a deer that they've killed or a dog or whatever, now I'm talking about the troop right here on my farm. Right. Yeah. 
without fail. And this has been this way for decades. They are always, the head is always pointed. They're laid out on the ground on their right side. Their head is oh, always wow. pointed south. Their feet are pointed east. Their rear end is pointed north. Always, Ooh. without fail. Wow. And and they have Give a, me a very, chill. and they have they have a very Indeed. specific way that they that they get into the into the body and 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 have in a very specific way they deal with the organs. I'm not going to go into all the details, but now no, but, but I'm about to tell you. I'll tell you off air because that like. I found that yeah. I don't. I don't know if that's just Alabama. I, I know I found exactly what you described right there on the river, yeah. where uh, a little bit west of where we went. Yeah, that's crazy. I've I've seen a couple of places where they were, where the heads would be pointed west rather than south. Uh, but there, you know, there are very distinct uh, characters. All right, I've and. You know, unfortunately, I I saw a lot of this kind of stuff before I started taking note of how methodical they were, and uh, I lost a lot of data. You know, when uh, when you know my journals got thrown away, so I don't know if if they could be. You know, if if different troops point them in all in different directions. Or what? But I just know that the ones here on my farm are extremely methodical and do it the exact same way all the time, and have done it the exact same way for decades. So it's something that's passed on from generation to generation. How about that? And, and I have seen, I've seen this uh, methodical uh, dissemina or, or uh, characteristics of and down in Mississippi and. You know, other other states. Uh, yeah, I got a question. I, yeah. Uh -huh. Have you ever come across in your area one that likes to lay out stones in like a crescent shape? Oh God! <laughs> I mean, I know everybody knows about them stacking stones, but that's the one I've never really heard anybody mention. But they, yeah. Yeah, uh, they. Uh, <laughs> Let me tell you, I've got a really nice brick fire ring out in the front yard that my brother-in-law built just here about three months ago. They got in here and they pulled half of the brick. They pulled half of the bricks out and made a crescent-shaped deal out of the bricks out of the fire ring. Wow! Now I'm talking. Now these these are not typical like concrete blocks. These are those. Uh, Wow. They're uh, well. They're they're actually they're they're concrete, solid concrete, but they're made. They're sort of curved a little bit, specifically for making yeah. retaining walls or fire about. pits and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, I've, I've seen those before. And the, actually, the ones that they left in the ground were in a crescent shape, and the ones that they tore out, it was perfectly round circle. And the ones that they tore out, they put them in a crescent shape. How about that? And. I've not ran into that uh, in the places I've been, but that's weird. Yeah, but they they come up in my yard. They mess with stuff. I've got a I've got a pile of I've got some bricks left over from I don't know what it came from. I, I don't know, but I, they move those things around and stack them in different ways. There's a there's a light pole out there in the yard. I'm talking about a, a booger light pole, you know, yard light pole. And they yeah. they stack they stack rocks up around it, you know, and yeah. I mean, they do all kind of crap right around here. And yeah, <laughs> no, I'm going to find it. <laughs> but, but, but yeah, but they have, when I was a boy, there was a place that we used to like to, to camp and have picnics and stuff back on the back of the farm. And they would get in there and, and we'd build a fire pit and you'd come back to, I'd go over and build a fire pit because we were going to come the next day or something. So I'd have the fire pit already. We get there See, they're torn all to pieces and slung all over the place, or half of the rocks are gone. They're just like a semicircle there, and you know, twenty wow. feet away, there's the rocks that that they took in a semicircle or some other, you know, usually in a semicircle. Yep. But, this uh, taking place in two different areas. That but, that's that's fascinating to me. Uh, that, yeah, some something what to about that. In Alabama. 
Yeah, but even still, though, I mean, in different places. Well, at any rate, we, we could go on with this all night because there's so much, like, we open up a can of worms and we're going to have all the fish out of, this, out of that pond because uh, there's so many questions. And that's why I named this Bigfoot 101. I, I knew exactly what it was going to be. And yeah. uh, I'm grateful for it. Again, folks, yeah. Bigfoot University, you're talking to the headmaster right here. Yeah. We're grateful he comes uh, for back. you coming I got out. more questions. I, I got more questions. Yeah, but you, but these yeah. guys, who, uh, one grew up around them, and I'm uh, stupid enough to go down there to uh, on the river with them. <laughs> so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we sincerely thank y'all for being such a great audience. We're, we, st st instead of going down as the show went, we're at 80 uh, people. I hate to leave y'all, but I'll tell you what, um, Kumbo, would you be willing to come back in the future? Oh, absolutely. Yes, sir. Absolutely. It's, it's an yes, honor sir. to have you, sir. Again, you're one of the greatest. Yes. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, okay. this has been the BDRP late show this is mr kumbo baker uh are you do you have any well, you're retired so yeah that, that yeah. that's what makes this even more special to me so <laughs> yeah. again it's been an honor been a guest of honor oh, thank you absolutely oh, thank the you. guest of honor so uh oh. folks again thank you very much hit the like on this uh because you know you liked it you know you did hit the like button subscribe if you haven't already click that bell so you can stay up on all the new content because we got even more awesome stuff coming your way yeah. talk to you next time guys yeah.